Okay, let's get going. Um, Andrew, can you hear me okay? See the slides? Everything looks good? Yep, all looks Great. good. Okay, so last lecture today. Uh, I know everyone will be sad, but you'll have some comfort and you get a holiday break. So we're going to talk about uh, a few different architectures. First about embedding Knox, and then some, some alternatives to traditional FPGA architectures. Okay, a bit of administration. Uh, assignment four has been released. It's due at the end of the day on Sunday, December 20th. Uh, it's worth 14% of your final mark. Not as open-ended as the last two, so hopefully it won't take you a uh, huge amount of time. Um, you have to do several VPR experiments. Uh, so the VTR CAD flow that you're using can do logic synthesis, uh, as well as placement and routing. Uh, just to simplify things, you're starting with pre-synthesized circuits and have kept them pretty small. Uh, so thousands of lookup tables instead of hundreds of thousands of, of lookup tables uh, and their logic uh, and routing only. So no, no RAM blocks and DSP blocks just to keep the architecture files simpler and keep the CPU time down by running smaller designs. But if, if you were publishing a paper, you'd want to use bigger designs. Um, you have to do several VPR experiments to check things like, you know, how does wire length and how do FC affect uh, routability and area. Uh, and then you're asked to find a better routing architecture where you can change basically anything you want. Um, generally, you can't find one that's hugely better. So in you know, assignment two and three, as you tuned up your algorithms or your uh, implementation of the convolution, you could do much better than your baseline. Uh, of the architectures you look at in the first part of this lab, some of them are pretty reasonable. So you're not going to find something that's hugely better. You can find things usually that are a bit better. Um, but don't, yeah, don't think I need to find something vastly better or I failed. Uh, generally, that nothing vastly better uh, exists uh, for these smaller circuits. Um, in addition to talking about, okay, here's a better architecture I found, or maybe I couldn't find a better one, explain your thinking and, and how you searched. So did you write a shell script that, or some kind of script that tried all sorts of things? Did you think about it and come up with a very uh, logical explanation of what you were going to try? Um, but explain how you did this. Research summary report, uh, I've pushed the due date uh, as late as I can. Uh, Corcus won't let me set a date beyond December 31st, so it's due at the end of December, the day, December 31st. There's no reason it has to take that long, so strongly encourage you to just finish it early, go enjoy your holidays. You can get this done anytime. Um, if December 31st turns out to be a hardship, send me an email. Um, but hopefully it's not, and hopefully you have some time for a break. And today is the last lecture, so. Uh, yeah, I have no plans to be madly marking them all on January 1st, so if it turns into a hardship, as I said, send me an email. Uh, so assignment two, uh, convolution. We, we said we'd uh, let you know who, who did the, the best on this, and uh, the best solutions are actually amazingly good. Okay, so kind of reading, uh, Madi and Marius did extremely well. They got five teraops per second. Uh, which actually matched our best, by our, I really mean Andrew, he did put all the hard work into this, uh, reference solution. So pretty well-tuned reference solution that uses uh, only DSP blocks. Nadia and Marius were able to, to get that. Uh, and Andrew did not go beyond that in our reference solutions, but several students did. So Camilo got to 7.6 Terra Ops by getting more copies uh, of the design by using a mix of soft and hard logic and running them at 380 megahertz. Uh, Gil and Isidore took different approaches, but got basically the same result of 12.4 teraops uh, by getting, again, a large number of copies, um, a mix of soft and hard, and uh, and then getting the clock frequencies pretty high as well. And they got the same answer, but in somewhat different ways. So Gil went for frequency, Isidore went for parallelism, and, and they wound up in about the same spot. Uh, and Edwin uh, is the, the grand champion, 14.1 teraops per second. He got uh, over 1,500 copies of the design uh, by using hard and soft logic, and he made them all run really fast, 550 megahertz, which is a, basically the DSP block limit, so you can't really push it past that. Uh, so these are really big numbers. So the CPU, by comparison, using all four cores and the best compiler settings uh, and the best uh, version of the code that, that, uh, that we tried, uh, got well under a teraop, a 50th of a, or a 40th of a teraop, and the GPU did better, but still only got about a fifth of a teraop. So, um, so this is an application that's very well suited to an FPGA. It uses relatively low precisions, 
highly parallel, uh, the communication is local, you get very good numbers. Uh, and later in the lecture, I'll tell you how to do assignment three. So yeah, so congratulations to, to everyone on here. And Edwin, I'll uh, be sending you an Amazon gift card. And you feel free to do a virtual clap on the uh, on Zoom if you know how to do that. <laughs> so, okay, this week's reading were two things. Uh, Tabula's time machine, so a different kind of architecture where it uses time domain multiplexing of the logic fabric and the RAMs to increase density. Um, so that's on Quarkus and the latest Sonics architecture, Versal. Uh, so we'll be talking some about both of those today, but can't cover everything in detail. They're interesting papers. Uh, and then for next week, in case you haven't gotten, you know, 10 marks that you're satisfied with on, on these papers, or you just want to do more reading, there's optional reading for next week, even though we don't have a lecture. So it's a, a flash based FPGA. So almost all the FPGAs we've talked about have been SRAM based, but that's not the only, that's the dominant way people make FPGAs, but it's not the only way. So the first paper is on a flash based FPGA, uh, meaning it's non volatile. It doesn't lose a memory of what its configuration is when you turn the power off. So that's useful in some applications where you really want to make sure the FPGA um, comes alive right away uh, when you power up the system uh, and it changes how you design it. Uh, and then the second paper is the latest FPGA from uh, Intel. So this is their 10 nan nanometer FPGA competitor to Versal and uh, the various changes they made to it. In particular, they changed the routing architecture quite a bit. Uh, and interestingly, Versal also changed the routing architecture quite a bit. Uh, Versal makes Xilinx's routing architecture in some ways closer to kind of the classic Intel architectures that we've been you know, looking at in academic architectures, where you have larger logic clusters, uh, pretty full-featured local interconnect. Uh, and Agilex, in some ways, moves Intel closer to the Xilinx-style architecture, where they don't they have more kinds of different wiring uh, so different a wide variety of uh, wire lengths between the logic blocks and they have less flexible uh, local routing because they they're finding that the local routing uh, if they make big crossbars that starts getting too slow so they're starting to make essentially smaller crossbars in the logic blocks so it's kind of interesting that Versal in some ways in terms of routing architecture is a bit closer to what uh, Intel has been doing for the last few generations. And Agilex in some ways uh, moves away from some of those techniques. So uh, it's interesting they're following somewhat different ideas. Uh, they both say they're doing it for um, essentially the technology changes that are happening in very advanced process nodes. Uh, okay, so uh, we talked a bit very end of last lecture very quickly about Versal and what they did as an answer to the Stratix 10 registered routing. So they didn't do registered routing, but they did do something else. So just was going to finish off that discussion. Um, so, so Stratix 10, is, as you remember, put pulse latches, so cheap registers, uh, on every single routing driver. So a lot of uh, pipelining ability. Versal, in their paper, they argue that they looked at that, they found it was excessive, they didn't want to do that. So what they did instead is they put inputs, they put registers on the inputs to logic blocks. Um, so what I'm showing here is basically their traditional logic block, just showing them a fracturable six LUT. It has two registers, you can use the registers or not use the registers. So that's like kind of a classic um, logic block from Xilinx. And what they've changed in Versal is they put optional registers, so you can bypass them with these muxes, on all of the inputs to all of the lookup tables. Uh, and then they add in uh, optional delay chains. So we saw an ultra scale that they put in these um, delay chains where you can program in different delays on your clock. And Looks like the very bottom of this uh, fell off the bottom of the slide. Sorry about that. Um, but these are the clocks. Uh, and they can delay them. OK, so is this useful or not? Uh, well, they have a, a nice figure in there showing how, how do they use this. So 
this is basically a picture of timing paths. Okay, so there's one timing path here. And let's see if I can change my color. Uh, there's another timing path here. Okay, so just showing I've got some path to this register, and then I've got another path coming out of that register. And there's some interconnect delay of 1.5 nanoseconds, and then there's some logic delay of 300 picoseconds. So this first path has a delay of 1.8 uh, nanoseconds. And the other path, the one that comes out of this register, is faster. Uh, one nanosecond interconnect delay, 300 picoseconds of logic delay uh, before it gets to the next register. So it's 1.3 nanoseconds. So the original clock period is obviously set by the longer of those two paths, 1.8 nanoseconds. So what, uh, what Zilings points out in this paper is they say, okay, well, now we've got these new input registers. So we can take this green flip-flop and we can move it over here, okay? Because we don't have to use the register after the logic block. We can basically retime that flip-flop to be before the, the lookup table because we have flip-flops and all the inputs. So instead of putting one flip-flop, turning on the one flip-flop on the output, we're going to turn on all the flip-flops of the inputs. And it's exactly equivalent from the point of view of anybody observing outside the chip. So they're going to do that. They wind up with a somewhat more balanced delay. They still have 1.5 nanoseconds on this side. And now on this side, uh, they wind up with 300 picoseconds. Oops, sorry about that. They wind up with 300 picoseconds plus one nanosecond plus 300 picoseconds. So they get 1.6 nanoseconds. Okay, so they've sped things up. So their input registers give them more retiming opportunities. They say, okay, well, the advocates of registered routing, uh, Intel, say it's it's not just about having more opportunities for retiming it's also about allowing deeper pipelining so zonic says well we can do that so we'll keep this register here uh but now we're gonna like the user is gonna redesign his or her circuit and put some additional pipelining in so they're gonna turn the output register back on and they're also gonna turn the input register on the next logic block on because they've got those registers if they're willing to redesign they can use them okay once they've done that their critical path is now uh, just set by this interconnect delay at the first, you know, this is the longest path from uh, that flip-flop to that flip-flop. So they got the clock period down to 1.5 nanoseconds. Uh, and now they start using that delay. So remember they have the ability to delay the clock. So by delaying the clock um, by 500 picoseconds, they don't actually move this register. So let me turn this back green again. Okay, so they don't move this register, but what they do is they uh, delay the clock to that register. And by delaying the clock to that register, they argue that from a timing perspective, it's as if they moved it into the interconnect. Um, so they're able to break up this long interconnect delay. Uh, and, uh, and now they've got one nanosecond of interconnect delay on this side. They got 500 picoseconds on the other side. And if you go through all of these paths, you'll see the longest one is only one nanosecond. So now they've got a, a pretty big speed up. Um, so, so that was a pretty good figure. It kind of explained what are they doing um, with these input registers and why did they put this, the, this ability to delay the clock to both the input and the output registers. Um, any thoughts on pluses and minuses of this versus Stratix 10? You got any thoughts? Just type them in the chat, or or you can be brave and unmute yourself. Yeah, so it's got a good point. This is one of the things Xilinx argues is that they basically keep their interconnect faster when you don't need the extra pipeline registers. There is a cost to adding those extra, even though Intel did it in kind of a, a clever and pretty cheap way by um, being able to turn the interconnect driver into a pulse latch. There are some extra transistors there. Some of them are in the pull up and pull down path, which means the resistance of so, uh, you know, the delay of some of those pieces is increased. Also just adding circuitry to anything tends to spread it out and make the wire capacitors increase. So there is some delay hit and they avoid that. Um, so that, that's their gain. Uh, and they also save some area by doing that, which again, helps speed too. Um, and Gil's also got a good point, it's cheaper but long paths can't use quite as deep a pipeline. And yeah, that's the kind of the fundamental trade-off here. So Xilinx's input registers 
are probably easier to use because they have all the regular muxing before you get to the inputs of the logic block. Remember, you generally build a routing architecture to have the right amount of muxing to get to every kind of block. And in fact, that's one of the things that Xilinx talks about in the Versal paper. It's one of the things we talked about earlier in the, in the course that you, should, you could put lo local interconnect in the logic blocks, you should put it in every block. Xilinx mentions that that's what they've done in Versal and they hadn't done that before. For the same reason that they've got local interconnect in front of, you know, in front of these registers, they're going to be easier to get to. So they don't need to build as many of them. Um, on the other hand, and because they've got this delaying the clock trick, they can break up long interconnect paths, but they can only break them into two pieces. Um, they, in the Stratix 10 architecture, you know, there are so many registers that in a long interconnect path like this, you could insert a lot of registers because every, every routing driver can be a register. Now for hold time reasons, they can't actually turn them all on, but they could turn on maybe every second or every third one and get deeper pipelining. So, so yeah, so the Xilinx architecture is cheaper. Um, it doesn't enable quite as deep pipelining. It enables deeper pipelining in the earlier architectures, but not as deep as Stratix 10. Um, there's an interesting thing in Stratix 10 that because of the way the CAD flow works for Stratix 10 and, and Agilex, basically Intel's CAD tools have to place all the registers in logic blocks during placement. And only after placement, when they get to routing, do they start moving those registers into the interconnect. Um, so that actually means that Stratix 10 struggles to pipeline things as deeply as you might think. Um, because while there are tons of registers in the, in the interconnect, because the CAD tools first want to place them all in the logic blocks, basically just because that's the way the CAD tools have always worked. And I suspect it's difficult to make them understand when you're doing placement that you can put some of the registers in the routing. Um, if you very deeply pipeline a circuit, assuming everything is going to go into interconnect registers, it can give some problems to Intel's CAD tools because before they put them in the interconnect registers, they first want to put them in logic blocks during the placement phase of your algorithms. And if that results in problems in placement, then you, uh, well, you have problems with implementing your design, even though, no, you, even though you know that if you got all the way to routing, uh, they could be moved into the interconnect. So that's kind of the CAD challenge you have with a radical change, like, like putting interconnect registers in. Uh, okay, but these are the kind of my thoughts on that. So less area, less timing overhead. This is uh, basically I think what Edwin has said. Uh, another advantage that, that Xilinx gets is they can use full featured flip-flops. So their input registers have clock enable, clears, uh, et cetera. Um, whereas the, the pulse latches that are in Stratix 10 are just simple registers, right? They don't have clock enable. Well, they're not even really simple registers. They behave like simple registers. They don't have clock enables, they don't have clears, et cetera. That means that in some cases, uh, the CAD tools may not be able to take a regular register in your design and move it into the interconnect. It's a bit more tricky for them. Um, they do allow deeper pipelining, but as we just talked about, not as deep as Stratix 10. Um, and this clock skewing circuitry uh, is helpful by time shifting uh, the clock to a flip-flop. You can make the flip-flop from a timing perspective kind of appear to be in the interconnect. So that makes it uh, these input registers more useful than they might otherwise be. Okay, that was all I was gonna say about registered routing uh, and, and the versal take on adding more registers. Uh, any questions or comments on any of that? Okay, if not, we'll go to our next topic. So lots of topics and this is the last chance to cover them. So uh, network on chip enabled FPGAs. Uh, so this is work that uh, one of my PhD students did uh, a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and he published several papers on it. This is kind of a summary paper that had a lot of, a lot of the key things he did. Um, but in the slides, I'll talk about a few of the other things he did as well. Okay, so what, what motivated this? The challenge is that FPGA systems keep getting bigger uh, and you have wider and wider buses hooking everything together. So what's called the system level interconnect. So uh, in particular, you get really wide buses between big modules and to your off-chip IO, like your memory controllers. So you have this memory controller and it's sending lots of data to different modules. And that's all gonna be this high bandwidth data. So we're gonna need wide buses for that. We're gonna wanna run them fast. We also have some high bandwidth communication between some of our soft modules um, and so on. 
Okay, so what do, what do people do um, in a traditional FPGA? Well, they design a soft bus for every one of these sets of connections. So for the communication pattern I just showed you, you build a, a bus. Um, so a bus is basically multiplexers. Usually you have some pipelining, so you have some registers and some arbiters to decide you know, who controls the bus. And so I've got a bus here from this memory controller uh, that goes to you know, several different modules, okay? And it's actually gonna take a lot of logic um, because it's wide. If I'm trying to move a lot of data, it grows quickly. Okay, so we're trying to build wide links. Um, so these buses are usually hundreds of bits. They sometimes now can even get to thousands of bits. And we're building them out of single bit programmable interconnect. So um, that can get big. If we're gonna build a 256 bit wide bus, then every multiplexer that allow you know in this bus that allows us to uh, connect multiple modules to this memory controller, uh, every one of them is a lookup table. If I need to have 256 bit wide buses, that's 256 lookup tables. If I need to pipeline it to get across the chip, every stage of pipelining is 256 bits wide. Um, and so it, it gets pretty big pretty quickly. Uh, the frequency of it can be, you're also trying to run it fast because we, it's high bandwidth. The way you get high bandwidth is either a high frequency or a wide bus or both. So we'd really rather not make this bus any wider than we have to, like 256 bits is already pretty wide. So you're going to try to run it pretty fast, which means the timing constraints tend to be uh, challenging. Um, and that means this can be a bit of a pain in your design. You, it may not close timing. You may have to go in and add more pipeline registers. And this is not the secret sauce of your design. This is, you know, you're trying to connect to, in this case, a, a memory controller. So you don't consider that like your, your secret value add that uh, nobody else has. So you kind of consider this important, but plumbing. You just want to hook everything together. So you'd rather not spend a lot of uh, time on this. So you're making, so everyone, every application has different buses though. Uh, what I've shown here is a certain pattern and a certain made up design of communication. Um, so when you're designing, part of your design is going to be hook all these buses up, make sure they close timing. The, the CAD tools ideally would just always guarantee the close timing, but they're going to struggle to do that given your, your uh, relatively high frequencies on these buses and their width. So that makes them a pain. Okay, so it makes these costly in, in design time, in resources, in power. Okay, so um, how could we do better? And one thing that came up actually when I was at Altera is, well, maybe we could build a hard bus, all right? So what's a hard bus mean? Um, it means that we would, we would basically just take these buses um, and the classic FPGA thing to do if something is in your way and it's important is, well, could we harden it? So could we make special circuitry uh, to make these buses more efficient? So, you know, what is a bus? It's basically a whole bunch of muxes and arbiters and pipeline registers. Um, so could we build a hard bus? So I think I'm going to try a breakout room on this one. So the questions I want you guys to answer uh, is, and maybe I'll type them in the chat so that hopefully you can still see them. So could we harden uh, a bus structure in an FPGA? Okay. Um, so, and the questions to, to help figure that out are whenever you want to harden something, you ask uh, how often is it used? Okay. And what we're trying to build is system level interconnect. So how often are we gonna have that kind of system level interconnect um, such as I've shown here? So how often is it used? You know, how expensive is it? Uh, so is it worth hardening? Uh, and then how, if we harden something, how reusable is it? Okay, so is it generally useful to maybe not every design, but to many designs? So you know you can harden anything. And I saw this, 
I think an almost infinite number of times when I was at Altera, when I would meet with customers and ask you know, for feedback on what they would like in the next generation FPGA, the most common answer was take my current design and harden it, which we're not gonna do, right? We're not gonna take uh, a certain design and just say, let's take, you know, let's just build an ASIC for that so that it's perfect for that one customer if they do the same design and it's useful for everybody else. So reusable is kind of difficult to assess, but if you harden something and, and it's only useful to one design, then that was a really big mistake. You got to find things that are more generally applicable than that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to try putting everybody in a breakout room so I can figure out which computer is controlling this. And let's see. Okay, maybe this computer is controlling it. So. Okay, so this computer is controlling. All right, so I'm gonna put everybody in a breakout room and uh, hopefully you can still see the chat, but just in case, take a look at that now. So yeah, this is a real question that I was asked multiple times when I was at, uh, at Altera and, and one of you know, the teams that I ran was uh, basically half of the next generation architecture team. We know we've got these wide buses. We know they're going to certain, you know, things like memory controllers, can we just harden these buses and get them out of customers' designs? So uh, I'll give you a few minutes to discuss that. Think about, is that doable? Are there problems? What are the answers to the questions I just posed? Okay. Uh, Andrew, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I was in one of the breakout rooms. Uh, anybody want to summarize what you thought about this idea of hardening a bus? Does it make sense, given all the questions that I put down? Any challenges? I think there were some interesting ideas in our breakout room. So somebody there, there can was, summarize that. <laughs> there were some interesting ones in ours too. So if uh, uh, if Gil or Tony, if you want to summarize your ideas, I think they're interesting. So yeah. So Camilo says the biggest challenge is generality, uh, and we can say it wouldn't be reusable. So be cheaper in area and power wouldn't make much sense to harden it. Uh, and yeah, I think that those are good points. Um, place and route will be hard because of limited endpoints. Yeah, so you're hardening a bus to exactly where. You're kind of pre-choosing its width. You're choosing where the endpoints are. Now things have to just connect to those endpoints. So have you really made life that much easier? Um, and you've chosen how many endpoints there are. So you've made a lot of decisions and it's probably not gonna be extremely uh, usable. Um, so that was actually ultimately my answer, uh, close this up, you know, when, when this came up in one of the architecture projects I was working on of, uh, we know we've got a bottleneck to, uh, memory controllers actually in particular. So it was definitely a bottleneck, but I don't think we can solve it by just hardening a bus. Uh, there was a good comment in our breakout room of if you have something like a processor subsystem that it. You know, it makes more sense there. And the difference in a processor subsystem is, you know what you're connecting to. I've got a processor, I've got some peripherals, I want to connect the processor to the memory controller. So I actually know where my endpoints are, I know what their bandwidth is. Now I have enough information that I can harden it. And it does actually make a lot of sense to harden the buses inside of a processor subsystem. Uh, in fact, the first generation of hardened processors from both Intel and Xilinx um, 
were not very successful because they, they just put down processor cores and they didn't really harden uh, much else. No peripherals, no buses to the peripherals, et cetera. So they didn't really build enough of a processor subsystem for it to be very useful. You could build it out of a soft logic, but that was a pain. The next generation, which is what we're using now, um, built not just processors, but peripherals, access to memory, et cetera, and built buses to them. So they're much easier to use. But for connecting the soft logic to everything, yeah, you have this problem of it's not clear where to put the bus endpoints, how wide to make them, how many, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and Diana's pointing out bus width is an issue. Um, so choosing the bus width is gonna be challenging. If you build it too wide, things are gonna waste it. If you build it too narrow, it's not very useful. So those are all good points, okay? So the, for the hardening question, System level interconnect is in most designs, so we passed that test. Uh, is it costly in area and power? So is it worth hardening? Yes, it is. So we passed that test. Um, but our basic problem, okay, so if we choose to harden this, so I'm just showing what if I hardened a bunch of buses? So I built pre-built the muxing and arbitration here. I pre-lay out a bunch of uh, wires. Um, it's great for the design I showed you, but if I take that design out, Okay, so I remove all those modules. Somebody else has been doing a different design. They have a different group of modules, different sizes, different communication pattern. They basically just don't map onto those buses. Um, so this other design, I've got things connecting to PCIe and uh, more and to memory controllers less and they connect to each other in a different pattern. And it's just not clear how I can use these buses. So it doesn't really work. It's too design specific. Okay, so what we need instead is uh, well, we could just stick with the current soft interconnect. So that's one strategy. We just give up and say, there's nothing we can do. Um, but the other approach would be to say, well, is there a more general system level interconnect that we can harden? So it needs to move data between arbitrary endpoints. Uh, it needs to be high bandwidth so we can match you know, the needs between big modules and in particular to IO interfaces. Um, IOs are, play we know where the IO interfaces are, memory controllers, PCI Express, et cetera. And we know they produce a lot of bandwidth and therefore they need high wide buses. So that's a, that's a good anchor for us to use to decide how much bandwidth do we need. And, and obviously we want them to be efficient. If they're not efficient, we shouldn't put them on the chip. Okay, so a network on chip um, satisfies those, well, possibly satisfies those. We have to go look at it. Okay, so how would we make an embedded network on chip? So a network on chip is basically two things. It's routers uh, and it's links. Okay, so these little circles are routers. Um, and these routers are a bit more flexible than the just muxes and arbiters that we had in traditional buses. So these routers are gonna look at uh, a packet header. Um, so they're basically little versions of internet routers. They look at a packet header and decide where is the uh, data part of this packet supposed to go. Uh, and then the links are just the wires in between these routers. So they connect the various routers together. Um, and it's, it's basically a complete interconnect solution. It moves your data, it can switch your data to different spots, and it can buffer your data um, to basically make sure it gets high throughput. It has buffering built into it. So it doesn't have lots of back pressure that slows you down. Okay, so how does it work? So say I've got some data in module four and I want to send it uh, across the chip. So module four has to packetize that data. So it, it takes its data and it, in, it adds a little bit of information, a packet header that says, where do I want it to go? So look an address, okay? That packet will be divided up into smaller units called flits or flow control units. That's basically what's going to get sent every, every cycle. So we're not going to send the packet all at once. We're going to send, uh, uh, it in over multiple cycles uh, as multiple flits. Okay, so and this nice animation shows how that happens. So and this animation is so nice, I'm gonna show it again. Okay, so each of those flits, basically the module puts it onto the nearest router. Okay, so it has an access point to the nearest router. It sends the data into that router. The router looks at the header uh, and decides where it has to go. And it sees it has to go to the right. And that happens over several routers until we get over here. This router sees it has to go down, it sends it down here. This router, when it examines the packet header, sees, oh, this is actually destined for me. So I'm gonna output it uh, back to the soft fabric and the module around me can get it. Okay, so that module now has all the data and it can, if it wants to, reassemble it into one big data word or maybe it was happy with it in pieces. 
Uh, okay, so that's how it works. Um, does this meet the test of generality? Okay, so let me just go back so you can see this. This is like my, my first test case. I had these four modules. Now let's say I, I've got a different design and that different design now has five modules with a different communication pattern. And we're not talking to memory as much anymore. We're instead talking more to PCI Express. So that's where our hardened bus kind of fell down. It no longer served any useful purpose for this new communication pattern. How does the knock do? Okay, so let's say this module five wants to send data to PCI Express. So it again puts a packet header on that to say, uh, essentially give the address of the PCI Express block, saying is where I want the data to go. That's cut up into flits and sent over multiple cycles. Because every router looks at this packet header to decide, you know, where does it send it, which which link does it send it out on, and therefore which router does it send it to next, um, we can follow a completely different path. So with the same knock, we were able to send data from module five you know, to this PCI Express block. Okay, so, so it does move data between arbitrary endpoints. It's a, a more flexible interconnect structure than a bus. Um, okay, so to answer the other two questions, I have to kind of look a bit deeper into how would we build this thing. So it looks like it would be useful if we could build it efficiently, but we now have to see, well, uh, how much area does it take and so on. Okay, so to build a, a hardened knock, um, because you can build soft knocks too, right? So you can build anything out of FPGA fabric. So we could just say, we, we kind of like these packet switch knocks. We'll just build them out of LUTs and flip-flops and block grams, and we can do that. We can just write the, the Verilog to do that. Um, we we'll also want to see, well, maybe we should change the architecture. Maybe we should actually harden something. Um, so a, a knock consists of three things. I already told you two of them. There's a router. Okay, so the router basically has multiple ports or inputs, and it decides which ports, data that comes in at one port, it decides what ports should it go out on. So it performs a switching function, and it also has buffering. The links, as I said, are just buses of wires, right? So uh, groups of wires that connect one router to another. And then at FPGA NOx, we get this extra thing called a fabric interface. So the fabric interface is some extra logic that allows us to talk to kind of arbitrary soft logic. So in an FPGA knock, you have this additional challenge that you wouldn't have in most chips of you do not actually know what this compute module is because that compute module is gonna be programmed into the FPGA after you manufacture it. So because I don't know what that compute module is, I don't know its clock frequency, I don't know um, how much bandwidth it's gonna need, I don't know what bus width it might want, we put a little more flexibility into this fabric interface, something that can bridge this router uh, which is going to run at a certain you know, fixed frequency uh, and it's going to have a fixed link width. So something that can bridge it to this compute module, which could be anything. Okay, and one of the parts of the, the paper that uh, you were assigned was to look at what should be hard and what should be soft. So we have this router and we could make a hard router um, or we could just leave it soft and we have links, which we could um, fabricate into the FPGA as additional wires that go to you know, exactly one spot that go between two routers, or we can just use the existing soft interconnect of the FPGA. You know, we have wires that we can connect together. So what should we do? Um, another thing in the, in the paper that you were looking at is there are no hard boundaries. So it's one of the things that I've, we've talked about a few times in this course is that when you have hierarchical FPGAs, you kind of have a hard boundary where all your wiring uh, stops and to cross that hard boundary, you have to go up a hierarchy level. It tends to be bad because it's kind of an artificial boundary and designs may not want that. So if you can avoid it um, and island style FPGAs avoid it, that's better. The, a similar argument for, for hard knocks. Um, we could basically say that if you're going to communicate long distances in, in this FPGA that I've shown, so if you want to communicate uh, outside a certain region, we could say you have to go on the dock. So maybe this region, you can use local FPGA interconnect, but to go outside that region, you have to use the knock to get to some other block. Um, and, you know, in the paper we're reading, they say they didn't do that, right? Don't like that idea. The reason is we really don't know how somebody wants to use this chip. So we're just going to accept the compute modules could be any size and any shape. Um, and, uh, and we're not going to say that to cross certain distances, you must use the knock. 
It's just an option, it's not forced. Okay, um, this again means we wanted that fabric interface. We want this flexible interface to the fabric uh, so we can build any kind of compute module we want. Okay, so what do those components look like? So the router, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but basically there's, the heart of a router is a switch. So there's a crossbar in it that basically, this particular router I'm showing here has uh, five inputs, okay? And it has five outputs, okay? So it, it has inputs from, you know, north, east, south, and west, and outputs to each of those directions as well. Okay, so let's say the red is outputs and the greens are inputs. Um, and it also has input and output to the compute module. Uh, so that's enough to create a regular communication pattern. Um, the router is a crossbar, so it basically has to uh, be driven by some control logic. So this control logic looks at the headers of all of the packets that have come into the router, and it basically decides how to set the crossbar for the next uh, clock cycle, right? So how am I going to take some of the data that came in over here and move it through the crossbar to the output? Uh, and we have buffering. So we typically have a fair amount of buffering on the inputs. So we've got FIFOs there, and then usually a little bit of buffering uh, on the output just for timing reasons. The reason you put buffering in is uh, basically to deal with bursty traffic. So if you've got a burst of data, it doesn't, you don't get a lot of uh, back pressure right away where the router say, I'm busy, you have to wait. Um, they can tolerate a certain amount of burstiness uh, or multiple you know, multiple packets trying to sort of colliding at a router. So you put some amount of buffer in. Um, this is what I'm showing you here is a, what that paper uh, assumed as a router. And it's a pretty standard, fairly full featured uh, network on chip router. Okay, should we harden it or not? Because we could just say, well, that's a good idea, but let's just build it all on soft logic. And then we'll just change the CAD tools to understand they can do that. Uh, maybe that's enough and we can solve all our problems. Um, so, so again, the work you're looking at tested, tested that. And to test it, it looked at 32-bit wide um, routers and links. Um, virtual channels, I'm not going to talk about much, but they basically allow you to, they make the, the, the knock more flexible uh, by reducing basically congestion of the knock. And basically this sample knock was implemented twice once in standard cells. So that's basically if I'm going to harden the, the design in the FPGA, that's how much area it's going to take. And once in an FPGA that used the same process technology. So that's basically I'm going to build a soft out of LUTs and flip-flops and the soft routing. And looked at three different options. So just build it completely soft. Don't change the FPGA at all. Build it partly hard. So harden the router, but don't change the links. Because FPGAs already have a lot of interconnect, and that interconnect can be programmed to connect anything. So we'll just use it to connect our routers. The routers are going to become like essentially new function blocks, but they're not going to change the interconnect. And then fully hard. And fully hard, we get routers as new function blocks, but we also connect them with a new dedicated interconnect um, that only goes between the routers. Okay, so uh, so let's see what what does it look like if we harden the routers but leave the links soft. So. Basically, we want to make sure it's going to route. So we use the same kind of interconnect structure to connect the inputs and outputs of the router to the programmable routing as we normally would. So in a Stratic style FPGA, that's two levels of muxing on inputs. So there's an input connection block uh, here. So that's your input connection block. And then there's a local routing. And then on the output, you just basically have the SE output, you have the output connection block. So basically, we put in routing to the general uh, uh, muxing to the general uh, FPGA routing that is very similar to what you'd have in a logic block, so that it's no harder to use these routers than it is to use a logic block. Okay, so we've now got a couple things to implement in terms of figuring out how much area that we just add to the chip. We've got all of the logic that's actually inside the router, you know, that, that crossbar and the uh, uh, the FIFOs that are your buffers and so on. And we also have these MUXs that are our routing ports, you know, our connection to the programmable interconnect. Uh, and for this 32-bit wide router, 
Um, it took nine times the area of a logic block. Uh, so we'd have to replace a three by three region of, a log of logic blocks with a router. Okay, and, uh, and we'd have to do that you know, in various places in the FPGA to make this very useful. So uh, in this study, they did it in an eight by eight mesh. So you wind up with 64 of these routers. Uh, now you have to see how fast it'll run. It turns out that the programmable interconnect between the routers is the limiting factor in this case, because you're just using the regular programmable routing, and they can run at 730 megahertz. So that's how fast the knob could run. Still pretty good in 65 nanometers. You're not going to be able to build soft buses at that frequency. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the details of that. Um, an advantage of using these soft links is while well, we've hardened the routers, so we have removed some logic blocks. You know, whether you use these routers or not, some logic blocks are gone. So you're getting these routers whether you want them or not. But we haven't replaced, we haven't kind of removed any of the programmable interconnects of the FPGA. We're just using it to connect the routers. So that means we can actually use any topology of knock we want. So you could decide what's appropriate for your design. You might make a ring. You might make some kind of fat tree, uh, whatever you need. Okay, some funny uh, shape that nobody knows what it's called, etc. Okay, so that was uh, one option: harden the routers, but don't change the interconnect. Second option is harden the routers and also put in dedicated wiring. So dedicated wiring, you know, we need to have some extra metal, um, and we're going to put wires that are. You know, kind of like the DSP cascades or the carry chains, like they go exactly one spot. They go between routers and nothing else. This actually saves us logic er or transistor area because we get rid of the uh, the muxing, the programmable routing ports. We can just have basically buffers now. Right? These wires are simpler because they only go one spot. Uh, so actually, this makes the router, if you're dominated by transistor area, this actually makes the knock cheaper. Uh, a router plus these dedicated links only takes seven times the area of the logic block instead of nine times. Um, and this dedicated interconnect can be made faster because it only goes one spot then, and has no switching uh, than the general FPGA router. Okay, so this actually worked pretty well. Um, we do have to fit these additional green wires in, in the interconnect stack, uh, but it's not a huge amount of extra wiring. So uh, that micro paper and some of the related ones make the case that it should fit in the metal stack. Okay, so now we always have a mesh, okay, because we've got dedicated wiring. There's no more you choose your own topology. It's for sure a mesh, whether that is the best choice or not. Um, but it runs faster in 65 nanometers around at 900 megahertz. Okay, uh, okay, so how did, how did this compare to soft? So if you build a packet switch knock like this out of soft logic, a single router takes you, um, you know, plus the links to the other blocks takes you. 4.1 square millimeters of logic. Uh, and it only runs at 166 megahertz in a 65 nanometer FPGA. If you harden the router, but not the links, uh, the area drops by 22 times per router, and the speed goes up by 4, 4x, four and power drops a lot too. If you harden both the router and the link, it's even better. 27 times reduction in area, and the speed at which you can clock it goes up by almost 6x, and power drops even more. Um, so we often take you know, area times delay. So we combine these two to get throughput. So you're getting 150x throughput per area. Now you're not gonna use the whole knock. Um, whenever you harden something, like you gotta harden this knock, you're gonna harden a certain number of routers and probably very few applications use every single router uh, and some may not use any. Um, so you are gonna waste, for some designs this will be wasted. Um, for most designs, at least some will be wasted, but this is still a really big improvement. So 156, 50X is really big, even if you don't use every router fully. So that looks pretty good. <clears throat> okay, so flexibility though. Now, so that means the case for hardening is pretty strong. Um, uh, and it looks like it's best to harden both the router and the links. Uh, and the micro paper says to harden them in a mesh. You harden them in a mesh, it's kind of similar to an ILA style FPGA. You don't know exactly what people would like to use, but you do know a mesh can be laid out efficiently. So why not do a mesh? Um, I already talked about this fabric interface. Okay, yeah, so the fabric interface is now necessary to make sure this knock's generally useful. Um, it, the knock is gonna run at, so knock's over here. 
Okay, so that's my input to my router from my compute module. And the knock's gonna run at whatever the maximum frequency it can. So in 65 nanometers, that was 900 megahertz for this knock. So you're gonna run it at that frequency. Um, but the module, the FPGA, what the person's put in the FPGA, their Verilog, you have no idea what frequency it's running at. It's gonna be different for every design. So maybe it's 200 megahertz, for example. Um, so how are we gonna bring these things together? So we bring them together in two ways. So we do the, the sort of classic FPGA thing of uh, take a wider but slower bus and um, bring it into a, basically do time domain multiplexing to convert it to a narrower, uh, faster bus. So we can basically take a 128 bit bus out of the module, uh, that's soft logic, and then, um, put a little bit of logic in that does time to be multiplexing and convert that to a 32 bit wide bus at 800 megahertz. Now 800 megahertz is still not the same as this router. Okay. So then we, we can use a, um, a dual port FIFO to basically we write data in on one clock and we read data out on a different clock. Um, and there's a little bit of logic to keep track of where are you writing and where are you reading from but this is a standard technique to cross between clock domains. Um, so basically we can bridge between these different clocks in two steps. We can have a configurable time domain mux dmux to match the bandwidth. I'm showing the input path, but basically reverse everything on the output path from the router. Uh, and it's good to have some configuration. If we put a little bit of configurability in here, we can allow the module to run at, you know, to basically use a wider or a narrower bus, depending on what frequency it's achieved and so on. And then this asynchronous FIFO, um, meaning that it doesn't assume any relationship between the clocks to write and to read, uh, allows us to cross between the clock domains. Um, so by putting in this fabric interface, basically we can use the full bandwidth of the NOC because the NOC can always run at its, at its maximum frequency but we haven't put any restrictions on the FPGA soft logic. These compute modules can, can use, they can choose from a few different data widths and they can use any clock frequency they want. Um, so we haven't put restrictions on it. Uh, and it turns out it's actually very important. You could build everything I just showed you in either soft logic or hard logic. It turns out to be really important to harden it. The reason it's important to harden it is these buses are wide. Um, so, if you leave this soft, it actually adds up to a fair amount of area. If you harden it, it's not very much area. So to make the knock efficient, it's not enough just to harden the routers and the links. You really also want to design and harden this fabric port rather than, so that basically the, the soft logic module can connect to a really easy interface. You want to have this fabric port to make it really easy for you. Does that make sense so far? So it looks pretty good from a physical perspective to harden it. And in fact, the study says harden the router, harden the links, and go even further, harden this new thing called the fabric port. Okay, so the next thing um, that the study in, looked at was how, how wide should the links on this knock be? Um, so I was just showing you a study that did 32-bit wide links. Is that the right choice? Okay, so that was, this is another paper uh, that I'm quoting results from. And it did the study at 28 nanometers. Um, at a 28 nanometers, a 32-bit wide hard knock could run at 1.2 gigahertz, so a bit faster. And that gives us 4.8 gigabytes per second per link. But then if you look at some of the things you want to connect to that knock, they actually have higher bandwidths. So if you look at memory controllers uh, in 28 nanometers, uh, depending on the exactly which memory standard you're talking to and so on, you've got data bandwidths of 8.5 to 17 gigabytes per second. PCI Express was similar, okay? If you used a, an eight lane wide interface, you got 8.5 gigabytes per second. If you used a 16 lane wide interface, which was also pretty common, you get about 17. Uh, and if you look at ethernet, uh, the two standards in 28 nanometers that are pretty common are 10 gig and 100 gig. 100 gig ethernet is 12.5 gigabytes per second. So a whole bunch of the IO standards that you'd like to connect to uh, this knock actually have bandwidth that is beyond what you'd get if you built a 32-bit wide uh, link and a 32-bit wide uh, router. So 
that doesn't look great. That means it's going to be difficult to connect to IOs, which was one of the main purposes of this knock. Okay, so you don't want to do that. What you want to do instead is uh, use higher bandwidth links. Uh, so in the micro paper, it moved to 150 bits wide at 1.2 gigahertz. And now you can carry 22.5 gigabytes per second per link. That's enough to carry the full bandwidth of the common IOs at 28 nanometers on a single link, which makes this much easier to use now. You can just connect an IO, an IO connects to the router and it sends all its traffic out to that one router, which steers it to other routers and it all gets where it needs to go. Okay, so that's a, in terms of choosing how wide to make the links, I think best practice is look at, look at the IOs and other kind of fixed hard blocks. How, what bandwidth do they need? Make sure you're not can handle that. Um, Let's see, when we're in the breakout room, somebody was uh, asking questions about high bandwidth memory, which has even higher bandwidth. Um, it has so much bandwidth that basically the best thing to do for something like that, where it's, it's unusual, has much more bandwidth than, uh, than other users of the system level interconnect is connected to multiple routers. So you basically, um, for something that's unusually high bandwidth, you don't want to make the whole knock so over provisioned that it can handle that whole stream on one router. Um, you have to connect it to multiple routers. But for the common things, like your DDR interfaces, you really want them to just be able to connect to one router and do what they need to do. Okay, so is it area efficient? Um, so you want to keep the cost of something new like this low. And the example that I was kind of following in, in this work was in the first generation of Stratix, um, that's where Altera put DSP blocks in the chip for the first time. And initially, there was nobody who was going to use those, right? Because FPGAs, uh, well, Terra FPGAs didn't have DSP blocks before, so nobody was using it. Um, but their die size was relatively limited because we put some in, but not an enormous number. Um, so it was about 2% of the die size. And in the first generation, most people did not use them. But 2% die size doesn't kill the product. It's a little bit of a cost penalty, but it's not too bad. Um, and then gradually, every generation more and more use them to the point where now you would never think about taking them out. Uh, so if we built 64 routers and they all used 150 bit wide you know, inputs and outputs, it would be too expensive. It would be well beyond this 2% of die size. So what we did instead is say, okay, well, if we've got to build 150 bit wide uh, routers, and we think there's a good reason for that, that's to match the IO bandwidths, we just can't build as many. So we'll make the knock more coarse. Uh, it'll get you close to where you want to be, but maybe not as close. So we're going to build 16 routers instead of 64. If we do that, the area is only 1.3% of, of a large 28 nanometer FPGA. So that looks small enough that it, it's feasible to put in a chip, even if it's not used by uh, everybody at first. Okay, but it's pretty area efficient. Um, as long as you don't build a a huge number of routers. Um, okay, where should I use this NOC? Okay, so a NOC has variable latency. Um, what that means, you know, you send packets in, they're buffered, they're registered, they take many clock cycles to cross the NOC. Um, so the NOC, latency of a NOC actually isn't uh, bad because those clock cycles are fast, but you don't know exactly how many clock cycles it's going to take to go across the NOC because there could be contention, uh, you might be buffered for a little while. Okay, so any thoughts? Where, where's a good place to use this? Is it good to use this between your ALU and your register file in a processor? Or is there some other place that you would rather use this? But basically, you'd like to use this where you can tolerate variable latency. So where in your design do you usually tolerate variable latency? Anybody who got this book. Okay, looks like either no one is typing it in or everyone's too scared. Um, so the, a good place to start is by the IOs. So IOs also have variable latency. When you go talk to a memory chip, you don't actually know exactly how many cycles it'll take before it responds. Well, you talk to a memory controller, there's a whole protocol for it to decide what does it have to do to talk to the memory chip behind it. 
Uh, you might have to do what's called a row access. You might have to do a row and then a, uh, or sorry, might have to might be able to do just what's called a column access or or a page hit. Or might have to do a row access and then a page and then a column access. It might uh, have to do a pre-charge first. Um, so it's not clear exactly what your latency will be. Um, similarly, if you go to PCI Express, you don't know exactly when the data is going to come back. So IOs already have variable latency. It means your logic must already have some kind of valid flag coming back telling it when the data is arrived, and you had to have built your logic to understand that 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 might be some. It might be ten cycles. It might sometimes be twenty. Your logic has to understand that. So IOs are the easiest place to stick a, a knock in, right? So you can use it for essentially your communication infrastructure. You've got a bunch of kernels that are all communicating and they, they might still use only the regular FPGA interconnect, um, but where they want to talk to the various IOs of the chip, uh, that's the most obvious place to start using a knock. Okay, so a little more on, on we now do an efficiency study uh, that's now moving a little more to the application level. Um, QSIS is, in, they keep renaming it, now it's called, uh, I think, Platform Studio, but it's, it's Intel's system integration tool. It'll make it easier for you to build these soft buses. So you're writing a whole bunch of HDL, you can just describe, here's what I want to hook together, and it'll, it'll generate Verilog files that are the soft buses you need. Uh, so we used QSYS to build um, some buses for interesting uh, test cases. So we're trying to talk to a DDR3 interface, um, which is 64 bits wide, running at 800 megahertz and using both edges of the clock. To match that data bandwidth on chip, we're using buses that are 512 bits wide, but 200 megahertz. Okay, so the buses have to be eight times as wide to match the fact that um, this is 800 megahertz times two at the DDR controller. And, and we're varying how many things want to talk to this DDR controller. You know, we might have one module, we might have two modules. Some of those modules might be conveniently running at 200 megahertz, which perfectly matches the bus frequency we're using. Some of them may not be, right? So this module is running at 250 megahertz. And if it's running at 250 megahertz, we need to build out of soft logic. So RAMs and logic, uh, RAMs and lookup tables and registers, we need to build uh, an asynchronous FIFO. So that clock domain crossing FIFO. Um, and uh, the bus itself consists of pipeline registers, multiplexers, arbiters, and sometimes these asynchronous FIFOs. Okay, so the competition, the what we're trying to see if it works better is a hard knock. So the hard knock is, in this case, was 910 megahertz, 128 bits wide. Um, again, to be able to move all the data from this across one link and one router. Uh, so basically one path in this knock is sufficient to move all the data from this DDR controller. So it can just connect to the closest router uh, and that'll be enough. Um, but when it decides that it's going to, some new data stream is happening and it wants to connect to this module, that's fine. It just puts a different packet header in and uh, the routers will get the data to the right spot. Okay, so, so we, we compared what is the area. Uh, if we're just building, we're just connecting a bunch of modules to one DDR interface. Um, so the hard knock always took the same area. The reason it took, always took the same area is you have to build the whole thing. So you build 16 routers with 128 bit wide uh, inputs and outputs and that took a little less than 2% of the area of, uh, of a big 28 nanometer FPGA. Um, the area that it takes to implement this with soft buses varies. It depends on what you're trying to build because the advantage of soft buses is you only build what your exact application needs. So if we are convenient, all of our modules are running at 200 megahertz, which means we don't need any cross clock crossing FIFOs, we get this line. Okay, so if we have one module that wants to connect to one memory interface, it actually takes less area in the soft logic than this hard knock. But if we want to have two modules share that DDR interface, already that costs as much area as the whole hard knock. And if we want more modules sharing that DDR interface, it gets worse and worse. 
if those modules were running in some different clock frequency, we need to add in uh, that extra clock domain crossing FIFO for each of them, and then the error is even worse. Now, even one module talking to uh, a DDR interface is almost as costly as the whole knock. And by the time we're at three, they're much more costly. Um, this hard knock can do a lot more than just connect a few modules to one memory interface. So even you know, way out here, we're not using most of the bandwidth of the hard knock. It could actually still connect us to PCI Express and some other memory interfaces and so on. So this is a pretty promising result. It looks like the knock is actually very efficient, even if you don't use, you know, most people will probably underutilize it, but even if you underutilize it a lot, it's a net win. Okay, so that's basically what I just said. We're not using all the bandwidth, but it's a win. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail. Basically, we do the same study for power, it's an even bigger win, um, but basically the same conclusion. All right, so a few other thoughts on this. So, um, so basically hard knocks look pretty good for replacing the system level interconnect, particularly to your IOs, this kind of communication infrastructure. Uh, what about the data center? So when you put an FPGA in the data center, pretty much everybody's adopted this notion of you have an accelerator that you call the rule and somebody is designing that from scratch with Verilog or some other tool. And then there's a shell, which the data center operator makes. And uh, that connects you to all of your IO and provide some basic security and so on. Um, and it can be big. So in Microsoft Catapult, it was 23% of the FPGA in, in this shell. Uh, whose basic role is to connect you to the IOs and provide some security. So basically what the shell is doing is a lot of it is building these soft buses. So it's building soft buses that are going to uh, give you access points to the IOs and then you build your accelerator and you connect up to those soft buses. Okay, and, and these soft buses have been pre-compiled, like this portion of them in the green has all been pre-compiled and locked down. So you can't change this placement and routing if you're a rule designer. Okay, so when you swap in a new accelerator, um, you know, this, a new accelerator you know, may use, let's see, we can see the animations. This, this particular accelerator uses three of my IO interfaces, but it doesn't actually use this one, okay? Uh, I put in a different accelerator and now it uses all four. So I had to build a shell that provided all four IO interfaces uh, because somebody might use them, but a lot of rules won't use them all. So we have actually had to over-engineer the, the buses that we put in the shell for the most demanding accelerator. Uh, we're also compiling the role in the shell separately, which can cause us some further problems in time enclosure um, because these wires are all locked down and predetermined. So even if this is not the nicest place for this uh, accelerator to connect to connect a bus to this DDR controller, uh, it has to, it can't change the shell. So we're gonna lose some optimization with these two separate compilations. Okay, uh, if you wanna ha have people share your accelerator, um, which isn't widespread in data centers at this point, but people would like to do, then you need an even bigger shell. So if I wanna have you know, four different accelerators, each of which can connect to my IOs, then you know, this pre-placed and routed and locked down shell actually has to essentially provide bigger soft buses. The soft buses have to provide every accelerator uh, with access to all of these uh, hardened controllers. Okay, so we can swap in now. So accelerator one gets swapped out, accelerator five goes in, it can still access the IO controllers through this shell uh, and so on. Okay, so, and I might put in a, a big accelerator that replaces them all. And now my shell really looks over-engineered because it's trying to provide everything, uh, all these IO components to a whole bunch of smaller roles. Okay, so what if we build an embedded knock? So if we built an embedded knock, um, basically the data doesn't just come into the IO controllers. Uh, those IO controllers can connect to the knock. Uh, so the knock can get them, can get the data without any soft logic kind of into the accelerators. So uh, essentially the knock acts as a big piece of the shell. 
We don't need to pre-build these soft buses in the shell anymore. The knock just acts as a replacement for all those soft buses. So now if we uh, swap out accelerators, uh, they can still all access all the IO controllers through the knock because they all have some routers in them. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details of this, but there's a, uh, another paper uh, that one of my other PhD students um, authored that looks at uh, if you use a, a hardened knock versus a traditional um, soft bus based shell, how well do those two things work in a data center environment? Um, so basically he did a few things. He took, this is a design where you're, you place and route the whole design all at once. So there's no shell and roll separation at all. And you get a certain amount of burning congestion in this design. If you instead say, no, I've got four rolls and they're floor plan to different regions of the chip. So that's my accelerator. And then in between them is my shell, my soft buses that will get me at my IO controllers. Uh, you actually get a lot more running congestion. So it's red is, is bad. Um, if you instead built a hard knock, so this knock, all of these little blue things are uh, represent routers, then basically your shell has access to the internals of the rolls just naturally, and, uh, and you can remove all these soft buses and you get a lot less running congestion. And uh, I don't think I'm going to go through the next couple of slides, but if you want to look at them offline, basically shows it's also good for timing. So for for data centers where you'd like to separate the compile of the shell from the compiles of the accelerators, uh, a knock looks extra good, right? It, it provides the system level interconnect for you and it's more flexible than these pre-compiled soft buses that you otherwise put in your shell. Okay, so the last few comments on this. Uh, what about interposers? Um, we talked about interposers last week and uh, they fit FPGAs very well. So they're being used pretty heavily in FPGAs, particularly by Xilinx, but there's a concern about uh, how well are these micro bumps gonna scale? So in the first generation that Xilinx did this in, Vertex 7, they could get a little more than 20% of the wiring you know, between the silicon die, right? At these cut points, um, because they could put micro bumps all over the region near the interface. Those micro bumps are getting a bit smaller as you go to more advanced processes, but not that much smaller. Um, but we're getting more and more logic uh, and more and more regular routing wires you know, in each of these uh, pieces of silicon as we go down from you know, 28 to 20 to 14 and below. Uh, so it means it's a challenge to keep the interposer routing bandwidth um, scaling at the same rate as the routing bandwidth within the FPGA. And we talked last week about a study that showed that if it was, if you had more than 20% of the wires crossing the interposer, things look pretty good. Below that, it looked more challenging. Um, and the fact that micro bumps don't scale as well as regular wires uh, means that, you know, there's a good chance we're gonna fall below this 20% and you've got a more and more difficult CAD problem. Okay, so a knock actually helps with that because if you put an embedded knock into uh, an FPGA that's made out of multiple pieces of silicon on an interposer, you know, you have routers in every one of the uh, FPGA pieces of silicon and you'd have links going between them. So some of these links, the link I just showed you is crossing between uh, dice across the interposer. Uh, on a hardened knock, you, you run the hardened knock as fast as you can. Um, basically the knock has registers on both sides of this wire um, it has buffering, it has clock domain crossing, et cetera. It has everything you need for whatever module is talking to this knock to basically get its uh, data converted to the highest clock frequency that works um, to the next router. Uh, so essentially it's using the limited number of wires that can cross between dice across this interposer uh, very efficiently because it's using them at a high clock frequency. Um, so the knock looks like a pretty good match to interposers as well. Okay, so any questions on that so far? Otherwise, I just got another comment or two on hard knocks from Bristol, and then we'll uh, uh, take a break. Okay, so I don't see any comments. So um, 
Okay, so the paper that you read was from 2014. So it was one of a series of papers that proposed, you know, hard knocks look like a good idea. Here's how you could do them. Uh, and in 2019, Xilinx announced that they were using a hard mock. It's actually very close to the recommendations of that micro paper in Versal. Okay, so what does it look like? Um, they have memory controllers uh, and you know other I/O controllers that can connect to the hard mock. They have um, a processor subsystem that can connect to the hard mock, and they actually have essentially a form of coarse-grained reconfigurable array. They call it the AI engine. It was really designed for 5G uh, communications infrastructure, which should also be good uh, at AI. So they have basically other you know, unique accelerators that can connect to the NOC. And they have the programmable fabric can connect to the NOC. So the traditional LUTs, wires, block RAM, et cetera. Oh, and here's the processor system, okay? Um, so the NOC goes throughout the whole device. The links are 128 bits wide. Uh, and they run at about at one gigahertz. And the reason is to match the DDR channel bandwidth. So very close to what we talked about earlier in this lecture of DDR kind of looks like the killer app for a knock, make sure you match its bandwidth. Um, it doesn't interrupt the programmable fabric. So that's probably not obvious here. It kind of looks like you've got islands of programmable fabric and maybe to connect from that programmable fabric to that, maybe you have to go through the knock. Uh, you don't have to. Okay, so all the programmable fabric routing wires, like your traditional, you know, you've got your MUXs and direct drive switches, they go across this. So there's no interruption in the programmable fabric. Um, the topology, you can see that there are, you know, this is a router and this is a link. So the topology is similar to a mesh, but not exactly a mesh. So it's, you know, it's a two dimensional structure where everybody's connecting to their nearest neighbor which is much like a mesh. Um, but to make this fit in a column-based layout, and Xilinx, like most FPGA vendors, likes to lay their FPGAs out in columns, they basically have taken, um, they've taken the routers and arranged them in entire columns, okay? Uh, so it's like they've taken the mesh and kind of pushed certain columns together uh, so that uh, they don't wind up with just a router here and there in the programmable fabric, which is what that micro paper proposed. Instead, they wind up with entire columns that are routers. Uh, now they don't have the wires for the knock going across this programmable fabric. Okay, so that doesn't exist. So to make sure they have enough bandwidth going horizontally, they basically, it's again, like they've taken multiple rows of the mesh and pushed them to the bottom. That's why they have multiple sets of routers with multiple 128 bit links. So similar to a mesh, somewhat more irregular connectivity, but more layout friendly because they pushed everything into columns or the top and bottom of the device. Um, they have actually quite a few, uh, let's see. So they build in fabric ports, okay? So every one of these routers has fabric port with cl hard clock domain crossing and so on. So they also follow the uh, the guideline of make sure it's essentially glueless. It's very easy for the arbitrary programmable logic to connect to you. Um, uh, but they actually write up with quite a few of them. So they, they have a hundred of these fabric ports. They don't explicitly say that means there are a hundred routers, but it sounds like they have quite a few routers. Um, and this is actually the only way to access the memory controllers. Okay, so I said it doesn't interrupt the programmable fabric. So we can connect these pieces of programmable logic using regular routing. There's not really any break here but it is the only way to connect to the memory controllers. Um, and what this allows you to do is now any spot in the FPGA can connect through the NOC to the memory controllers. It's not all it can connect to, but um, again, it makes it work very well for system over image connector. Uh, and Xilinx has a paper, uh, which I haven't assigned, but this is another paper on just the Versal NOC. So they have a whole paper on how this NOC works, but it overall is pretty close to the uh, micro paper. Okay, whoops, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay, so in that case, let's take a break till 545. So I'll take a six minute break. And be good to jump up and down and get some exercise if you can. So that's what I'm gonna do in the break to uh, make sure I have good energy. <laughs> 
Okay, we're back. So uh, actually before we go to the next topic, I was going to announce the assignment three contest winners. Uh, so actually some really good solutions. So my reference solution, which I uh, believe is pretty good. I worked, I worked pretty hard on, uh, gets an average area of 2.07. Uh, so Wendy, Sharan, and Vimeo all beat that by a little bit. Uh, Mary has beat it by a little more. Uh, Camilo and Victor a little more still. Uh, and then Yunli and Kimia. Uh, and then things got very close. Uh, Mike uh, was just ahead of Yunli and Kimia. And then there was a tie for first place, Edwin and, and Gil. So, so well done all. All of these solutions are uh, excellent. Um, it's, as I said, I think the reference solution is quite good. So I've never actually seen this many people beat it. Um, and Edwin and Gil, I'll be sending you uh, uh, a, a gift card in, in the email. Um, and everyone else will, uh, will also get credit on the assignment for doing so well. So congratulations. Um, okay, let's move on to the last couple of topics. So what is a different kind of FPGA, something called a, a DPGA or time domain multiplexed FPGA? And uh, there's been a few of these done over the years. Um, the one that went the furthest was by a company called Tabula. Um, so Tabula was a, uh, a startup that was around for quite a long time, developed a lot of technology, um, raised actually over $200 million to, to challenge Altera and Xilinx in the FPGA space. Ultimately wasn't able to do it because it's really hard to take on the established competitors. Um, you need to build an entire CAD system, an IP library and a chip. So essentially the FPGA industry is one where the incumbents are very entrenched because it is, you have to build so much technology to take them on. Um, on top of that, there may be some technical issues that you guys can weigh in on as we get through uh, what Tabula did. Um, okay, so as I said, a DPGA is, a, is effectively a time domain multiplex FPGA. Uh, so the motivation is that hardware is underutilized in an FPGA because it only does one thing per cycle. So computation goes through a lot in a fraction of a cycle, right? So if you think of, I've got a, a lookup table and before that I've got another lookup table and so on and a lookup table and eventually I'm registered. Um, the idea of a time domain multiplexed FPGA is, well, this lookup table is really only doing work during part of the cycle when basically new data arrived and it had to produce new outputs. Maybe we could time domain multiplex our fabric and make it do work more of the time, several times per cycle. Um, so that's one motivation is the idea of maybe we can get efficiency. The other reason or motivation for these dynamically programmable FPGAs is um, your circuit is, if your circuit is too big, the FPGAs have an undesirable behavior that they just can't fit in. Uh, in a processor, if your problem gets more and more complicated, your program runs slower and slower. You usually don't run out of memory, could happen, but usually you don't. In an FPGA, if your problem gets bigger and bigger, um, depending on how you structure it, if you structured it in a parallel way, the FPGA may just not be able to fit it. Uh, and that's undesirable. So the solution of this time to make multiplexed FPGA is to reconfigure really fast, several times per user clock. So these registers that I've just shown in this design, they would be connected to what they call the user clock, okay? That's what you as a designer actually specified. Um, but they're gonna make another clock uh, that's hidden from the designer and they're actually gonna time domain multiplex the hardware so that it does multiple things during one clock cycle that you asked for. So it's a bit like a processor. So ideally it is gonna keep circuitry busy uh, a higher percent of this user cycle, um, user clock cycle uh, and it's also going to increase capacity. You're going to be able to take, take bigger designs and get them into your chip than you would have been able to with a traditional FPGA. Okay, so how do they do that? So they, as I said, they divide a user clock into multiple, uh, what Tabula calls micro cycles. So um, here's my real clock that the end user specified. And in this case, I'm using a micro clock that is three times as fast. Um, which Tabula calls a context. So they're gonna reconfigure every block in every routing box three times in every user clock period. So every single microcycle, uh, they can have a lookup table, do something different. They can have a routing box, make a different decision about which signal gets copied to its output. 
Uh, so how are they going to do that? So in a processor, you'd broadcast an instruction, right? You have a program counter and you broadcast that to everything that needs to see the program counter. Uh, but a, uh, an instruction in an FPGA is enormous. So we talked about this earlier in the course, but it's depends how big the FPGA is, but even for a medium sized FPGA, we're talking like 50 million bits uh, to encode an entire configuration, you know, all the multiplexers, all the lookup truth tables, et cetera. Um, and Tabula wants these uh, microcycles to be very fast. So they were targeting one point, well, they did achieve 1.6 gigahertz for their microcycle clock frequency. So we can't broadcast 50 million bits uh, at 1.6 gigahertz. So what they do instead is they broadcast a pointer to the configuration memory. So an FPGA has one configuration memory. A lookup table is a truth table. Routing muxes have one set of SRAM saying, you know, which input makes it to the output. Same thing for their DSP block settings and so on. So uh, what Tabula did is they said, no, we're not going to have one set of configuration memory. Right, like an FPGA would have. So we've got a lookup table, and inside of it is a truth table. We're going to have uh, a bunch. Okay, so we're going to replicate all that configuration uh, in context times. And in the chip that they designed, n context was eight. So they made eight copies of all the configuration memory. And they uh, broadcast a pointer, which would say which one of these is active. Okay, so maybe this one is active. And that's currently the truth table of the lookup table. And the next micro clock cycle, maybe this one becomes active, and that is the truth table of the lookup table. Um, so there's a limitation in this because they're just broadcasting a pointer and they only built storage for eight configurations, they can never use more than, in context, can never be more than eight, right? They only have eight distinct configurations on chip. So they could decide not to use them all. So they can make n contacts less than eight, but they can never make it more than eight because then they'd have a pointer to something that doesn't actually exist on chip. Okay. So this is just a picture of the basic idea. Um, a traditional FPGA, you would just have, you know, a few SRAM bits that are controlling this routing mux. Uh, and you would have one truth table that goes into your lookup table. In a, uh, a tabular device, a multi-context FPGA or a time domain multiplex FPGA. Uh, I'm showing here, let's see, one, two, this is a four configuration uh, routing mux. So instead of having one set of SRAM cells controlling it, it's actually got four different copies of them. Okay, let me highlight those in different colors, right? So that's the first copy, that's the second copy, that's the third copy, and that's the fourth copy. We broadcast this context ID. It gets decoded, and it selects which one of these we're going to use. Um, and same idea for the lookup table. So it's like all of our configuration, if we wanted to support four contexts, we would replicate four times. And we would have a few of these decoders in the chip, right? Uh, we're probably not going to have just one. We'll probably have a decoder here and there. And, uh, and we're going to broadcast this context ID, and then the decoding will decide what we're, uh, which configuration we're using uh, throughout the chip. Does it all make sense to people? Any questions so far? I'm trying to assess whether there's digital confusion, uh, which is hard. <laughs> so and to take that as hopefully it's uh, clear. Okay, so how do you use this? That's what the hardware can do. Um, this diagram comes from uh, a paper by Steve Trimberger on this kind of FPGA. And it's showing how can we fit more logic into such a, a, a DPGA. So in a traditional FPGA, here's, here's a five lookup tables that I want to implement in a certain connectivity pattern. So in a traditional FPGA, you just say, I need five lookup tables, right? They have these names A through E and wire your inputs and outputs up as you've shown. So that's what an FPGA would do. In a DPGA or a time domain multiplexed FPGA like this, what we can do is we can say, well, A and B don't depend on any of the other lots. So we can compute them first, all right? At the start of our uh, user clock cycle, we can compute just those two lots, 
And in the next micro clock cycle, we now have everything we need to compute C. Okay, so we can compute that in the next micro clock cycle. So that would be two, this would have been cycle one. And after we've computed C, we actually have everything we need for D and E. All of their inputs are ready. So in cycle three, we can compute uh, D and E. Um, okay, so we've actually now, with only two physical LUTs, uh, we can do a five LUT circuit. Okay, so we have saved some lookup tables. Um, we did do that in three separate steps, each of which had its own micro clock cycle. Because basically, we didn't actually build five LUTs on the, on the FPGA. We just basically took two physical LUTs and we programmed uh, multiple configurations. Maybe we programmed, uh, let's see, maybe we programmed our first physical LUT over here with these three configurations. Okay, so all, the, all of those went into its, uh, in, into its three contexts. Uh, and then we built a second physical LUT over here. And into that, we programmed these two con configurations. Okay. Um, so we've, we're not doing everything spatially anymore. We're doing a mix of spatial and uh, temporal. Okay, so this is somewhere between an FPGA and a processor now. This is making sense. If you've got any questions, just jump in. Uh, let's see, can it dynamically choose which context to use or is it predetermined at compile? If predetermined, why does it need to broadcast instead of keeping a more local counter? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so in the academic works on this, they basically say, well, we could do it either way. And they come up with uses for what if I broadcast uh, versus what if I just have a counter and I walk through them. I believe the tabular architecture from what I've read about it just had a counter. Um, and you could say how, how high the counter should count before it rolls over. So uh, tabular could do eight contexts, but if this was my whole design, eight contexts aren't useful. I only actually need three to get down to two LUTs. So you could program the counter to count to three and then count, roll over back down to zero uh, because there's no purpose in counting to eight because the next several cycles, you won't do anything useful. Um, so yes, the academic work has looked at both those options, but I believe commercially what's more useful is just have a counter and you just decide what will happen statically. So the CAD tools work it all out. Um, they would work out, this is cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. They work out what, what uh, data to program into each context for each LUT and for each routing box. And then you're just gonna walk through them in sequence with a counter. Um, and that counter therefore doesn't have to be one global counter. You could have many copies of the counter. It becomes just a physical design problem. How many copies do you want? Um, and you'd probably have a whole bunch of copies, uh, each of which supplies the count to a local part of the chip. Does, does that make sense? Okay, anyway, good question. Uh, thanks for the question. So it, it is actually quite strange just lecturing to a screen where the only thing you can see is yourself on it. So when I'm looking to see if anyone is confused, I can only tell if I'm confused, which is always a bad sign if I look confused. Um, let's see, can we interpret this as five physical LUTs operating in a pipeline fashion? Yeah, it, so it, to, it, physically it is two LUTs, but from the point of view of the tools, uh, what, what they've done, it is five separate truth tables. So, so yeah, so you've got two physical LUTs, but they're behaving like uh, five, five LUTs working together. Um, let's see, is this actually any different than a hardened version of some extra inputs LUT fed by a state machine? Uh, let's see, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess, I think it is. The reason is you to do this, you actually need to make pretty big architecture changes. Like you need to actually on your chip store multiple contexts um, in order to map circuits this way. So traditional FPGA cannot do this because it only has one context. You can't have a single lookup table. You know, uh, every, every one of these micro clock cycles change what it's doing. Um, a traditional FPGA just cannot do that. Then you say uh, the multiple contexts basically a bigger light. If they behave more like, they behave like more LUTs, okay? So, um, because what happens when you go to a bigger LUT is kind of very complicated. Certain logic functions, you know, might 
they might fit in two four lets and one five let. Um, but there are other logic functions where they fit in two four lets and they still take two five lets. So, so basically let size affects things in a pretty complicated way. Um, whereas what they're doing is time to be multiplexing. So it looks like they have more lets. Uh, you know, let with more inputs, the, the relationship between a let with more inputs and several different lets is complicated. Um, if you have enough small lets, you can always make a bigger let. Okay, so I can combine uh, four, four lets, for example. Uh, well, if I, if I take five, actually, I'm going to confuse myself by this. Yes, with a sufficient number of small lets, you can always make a big let. Um, but usually, usually that's relatively inefficient. Okay, so you don't map circuits that way. You can make better use of the little LUTs than just kind of combining them together to make uh, really big LUTs and then program them that way. So, um, so anyway, these are good questions. Let's see if it becomes clear as well as we go further through it. Um, so, yeah, I guess this is a key a key point. The sorry, I'm just on top of my cords here. Um, the other thing that isn't apparent in this diagram, though is when I put this on two physical, uh, when I put this on two physical LUTs like this, yes, yeah, so I can get a better color. Um, okay, so I've got two physical LUTs. Those LUTs have to have multiple contexts. Uh, let's see what the best way to draw this is. So inside this LUT is multiple truth tables, okay? So we've already seen that. Same thing here, it's got multiple truth tables. Um, but we also, this LUT for one clock cycle behaves as LUT A. It produces a bunch of outputs, which have to actually, well, it produces exactly one output, I guess, this output, which has to be preserved so that uh, when I now change, okay, so I was acting as let A, that's here. And now I'm gonna change to be, let's circle this, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna become let C, the next clock cycle. Okay, so I'm gonna choose table changes, uh, I also need to remember what uh, value I produced, okay? Because I actually want to connect my old output back to myself, because that's actually one of my inputs. One of my inputs is from LUT A. LUT A doesn't actually exist anymore, right? LUT A was the last clock cycle. So I actually have to have the ability to put a register on this, because I need to save that value so that I can actually feed it back um, to myself for the next clock cycle. This LUT uh, is, you know, we draw this on, let's say this is the red clock cycle. Okay, so this lower LUT in its red clock cycle is B, okay? And it produces a signal which actually has to survive to get to E. And it's not going to be LUT E until two clock cycles later. That's when the counter will point to the purple uh, part of the truth table. And I need to have whatever value uh, be produced, you know, two clock cycles ago. So it has to be saved somehow, okay? Because I'm going to take that and send it back to myself. So that means I actually need to have a register on my output that can store this. And I actually don't need just one register. In this case, I need to store it for two clock cycles. Okay, so even though the LUT didn't do anything useful here, it still needs to save its output in another register. Um, so I've got to, I got to do this somehow, right? I have to save data uh, in essentially in time so that I can feed that data into my physical LUTs. So I need extra registers in my interconnect um, to save values that I'm going to need in a future one of these micro clock cycles. Uh, so that's pretty subtle but hopefully that's understandable. So it's not enough just to duplicate all the contexts, like duplicate the configuration memory. Uh, I also need to be able to save state. Uh, so I actually need to have registers in my router now. Uh, let me show you this and then you can tell me if it makes sense. So the micro paper does a nice job of showing this. Um, what Tabula does is first, they're the ones who actually came up with the idea of put a pulse latch in every single routing driver. They didn't ever, to my knowledge, publish that. Um, well, it may be actually in this micro paper. When they first did it, they didn't publish it. So I think the micro paper says that they have it. 
Um, so I, that's where Intel actually got the idea for pulse latches inside of their interconnect drivers for Stratix 10. So Intel used it to make a really register rich architecture. For Tabula, it was even more crucial. Um, they basically have a, an array of physical lookup tables and the routing between them. So that's what this XY dimension is. It's just a, a bunch of lookup tables and routing, okay? Just like you're used to. And a placement and routing problem in a conventional FPGA would just choose where do I put every one of my lookup tables so that I can minimize the kind of, you know, the amount of wiring I need between them. And it's going to find paths between my lookup tables like this, you know, go finding routing switches to turn on to connect everything. Okay, so that would be the two dimensional problem that an FPGA CAD tool has to solve. Uh, what Tabula did, which is quite clever, is they first they put a pulse latch at every single routing wire driver. So that gives them a ton of registers, which is what they needed uh, here, right? They needed registers to be, so that they could save state. They could save previous outputs from these uh, lookup tables so they can later reuse them uh, in future micro clock cycles. Okay, so they've got pulse latches to do that. So when they turn the pulse latch on, in a routing driver, essentially it is a, it is a, um, it holds the value for one clock cycle. And what they do is they make their, their placement and routing problem three dimensional. The third dimension is time. Okay. So to go in the time dimension, which is go to the next micro clock cycle, you turn on exactly one pulse latch in uh, the interconnect that you are, that a signal is passing through. And that holds the value for one clock cycle so it moves it vertically in this three dimensional placement and routing problem. Okay, so that would get them to basically context one. So I go back to this slide. Uh, using one pulse latch uh, is exactly what this LUT, this top LUT, needs to do. It needs to get the value from A, which is the uh, LUT that it was being for user cycle uh, one to C, which is the LUT that it's being for user cycle two. In order to do that, it needs to turn on exactly one pulse latch in a routing path that goes from its output back to its input. Uh, can't be two pulse latches, can't be zero pulse latches. And that sounds really complicated, um, but Tabula came up with this clever idea of that is the same as a three-dimensional placement and routing problem where the third dimension is time, and turning a pulse latch on moves you one unit up in the time dimension. Uh, and then they solve that three-dimensional placement and routing problem to decide basically which context within which LUT uh, completes each function. So it's choosing in both space and time who computes a function and which pulse latches to turn on and which regular routing switches to turn on to get all the signals to the right spot. Um, Hopefully that all makes sense. It's uh, it's quite clever. So I was pretty impressed when they did this. Okay, so what are the costs and gains? So costs, um, one set of configuration memory is typically about 25% of the core area of an FPGA. So what I mean by core area is not, in, not IO, okay? Everything except the IO, the DSP, the RAM, the routing, the logic. Tabitha is not building one set of configuration memory anymore. They're building eight sets to get their eight contexts. So that's going to actually increase their area a lot. That's 175% area increase um, for like their LUT plus routing, for example. Okay, so the benefit is that they could keep all the hardware doing useful work through the whole clock cycle. Okay, so they use this higher micro cycle rate uh, and they store intermediate state. Um, so even though they can't build as many physical LUTs because their LUTs are bigger, they can use a physical LUT multiple times during the one user clock cycle. Uh, the other thing that this gives them is their hard blocks, they can use their hard blocks better. So hard blocks usually can cycle very fast. You can build a very fast block RAM, um, but you, and usually you can cycle it faster and also you can build very fast DSP blocks. Usually you can make them faster than your programmable logic fabric can keep up with. Uh, for the typical designer. Um, so what Tabula did is because they know that these hard blocks are typically fast, they, they said, that's fine. We're going to actually design them to keep them fast. And then we're going to add a bit of time domain multiplexing circuitry at their input and output. So Tabula built a single port memory 
um, which saves area. If you remember back to when we were looking at memory architecture, a single net port memory only uses six transistors per SRAM cell instead of eight. Uh, it also only has to build one set of peripheral circuitry instead of two, so it's smaller. Um, they build those block RAMs and they can cycle them quickly, 1.6 gigahertz. Now, people can't normally design FPGA or time domain multiplexed FPGA designs that run at 1.6 gigahertz. So if the user clock was 200 megahertz, which they weren't working in you know, 14 nanometers, so that would have been a reasonable clock frequency for them. They actually have eight of these micro cycles to access the RAM. So the RAM can appear to provide, well, it can provide eight ports, but they're not doing it by building eight ports. They're doing it by um, basically time domain multiplexing in the RAM. They can access it eight times in that user clock. And because the whole chip is already time domain multiplexed, all the routing has these pulse latches in it, it's all built to handle time domain multiplexing very efficiently. So it naturally gives the end user an eight port RAM, but they only actually have to build a one port RAM. So they get the density uh, and they get a high port count. Um, let's see, so these are a few numbers that Tabula uh, claimed, which looked reasonable, right? You can never completely tell, uh, you know, exactly how a company does a comparison like this. Uh, but they, they claim that they get a logic density that's more than 2x that of a conventional FPGA. Um, so my back of the envelope calculation was that they increased the area of their architecture by you know, 175% with uh, three contexts. So let's say that they take three times the area per LUT, um, but they can now, each LUT can act as, uh, as eight separate functions because they have eight contexts. Uh, eight divided by three is a little less than three X, uh, kind of density increase in terms of how big a circuit you could fit. And this number, this ratio is also a little less than three X. So it looks reasonable. Uh, for memory bit density, they say they're twice as dense. Makes sense, they're building, uh, well, so this is the right ballpark. They're building one port RAMs instead of the two port RAMs that an FPGA is building. Uh, they get a lot of ports on their memory uh, because of time domain multiplexing it. Um, this is the one where it's hard. This is actually probably the key things. How much throughput do they get? And they say they're getting a big gain in throughput, like more than 3x. Um, that's actually the hardest thing to assess. Uh, because in order to get those kind of numbers, you have to kind of take everything into account. What's the area of their chip? How fast can they clock it? How many microcycles, et cetera? So this, this one, I think, is the one I have I'm most skeptical about. Um, and it's got the most computation in it. Uh, let's see. So Tabula calls uh, a context a fold. Uh, the hardware supports eight contexts, um, but you don't have to use them all if you don't want to. Um, and I already talked about this. So they, they build fewer ports on the RAMs, but time to make multiplex them. And uh, let's see. In their architecture, because they can run, they can run their micro clocks at 200 megahertz, if your design target frequency is, is higher, they can't use all their contexts. So if you wanted 200 megahertz or below, they can use eight micro clocks um, within one of your user clocks. If your target frequency was 400 megahertz, uh, then they could only use four micro clocks within your 400 megahertz uh, cycle. So they're gonna kind of wind up under utilizing their context in this case. So they're gonna be best at, at these lower clock frequencies. Uh, let's see. So I guess a few key questions. Throughput per unit of silicon is probably the most important thing. Um, the, the FPGA can build more physical blocks. I mean, a DPGA uh, is probably gets about 3x less uh, lookup tables in a certain silicon area because they have these multiple contexts. Uh, and that kind of lines up roughly with what uh, Tabula claims. Um, but the DPGA keeps its physical blocks more busy. It's cycling them at 1.6 gigahertz. So they're, each of them is doing multiple computations per user cycle. Um, it's not clear which one of them is better in terms of how much throughput do you get per unit of silicon because there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, but it's also going to be, well, how, I guess I'm claiming this will be impacted by the amount of pipelining. That also the answer is not going to be the same for all designs. Uh, so 
anyone want to venture a guess of like, why, why am I claiming that? That this comparison of an FPGA and a DPGA throughput per unit of silicon is going to be affected by how much pipelining you have in your design. So is more pipelining good for a DPGA or is more pipelining bad for a DPGA in terms of comparing it to an FPGA? Like what is, where is it going to look the best? Do you have a design that's very deeply pipelined or a design that is not very deeply pipelined? I guess I'm, I'm claiming that it's not the same answer for both those cases. Yeah, so Camille, I think you're saying that deep pipelining is better for a normal FPGA. Yeah, and I think you're saying the same thing, that in a DPGA, more pipelining is going to limit how many folds they can use because the clock frequency is higher. Is that a fair summary of your comments? So I think you both believe that the FPGA likes deeper pipelining and the DPGA doesn't gain as much from it. Okay. Yeah, and, and I completely agree. So basically the idea of the DPGA is, uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of logic in series. It's not just gonna be a linear chain, right? There'll be other registers coming in here and so on, but that I've got, I've got a bunch of logic and then eventually I get registered. So that I could, I could have one physical LUT do, do multiple duty uh, on this chain of logic. Now, if I'm a really crack FPGA designer though, uh, and I say, well, I don't like that design very much. I'm going to insert some more registers. I'm going to put a register there. Uh, actually, I won't put it there because that register, I need two registers for. Okay, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, now I am going to put that register there. Okay, so I'll put a register there. I'm going to put a register there. I'm going to put another register here. Um, then I'll put another register here. Okay, as I pipeline this really deeply, most of my LUTs are actually now busy for much or maybe even all of my uh, clock cycle. If I actually manage to put a register after every single LUT, then every LUT is doing useful work for the whole clock cycle. And the trend has been for people to pipeline more deeply. If you look at how FPGAs are evolving, you know, there's been a gradual trend to put more and more registers in. Uh, so Intel, when they went to fractable LUTs, they put more registers in. Uh, then they went all the way to putting registers into the routing. Uh, Xilinx um, has now put registers on not just their outputs, but also their inputs. So the trend is clearly to have more registers than an FPGA. And that's a challenge for a DPGA because you need these chains of LUTs with no registers in between um, to try to time to make multiplex. Um, so yeah, I think Intel, for example, by taking this pulse latch idea, put a pulse latch inside every routing architecture. I think that's a really clever idea that Tabula have, but I think had, but I think that the way Intel used it to say, let's use that to enable very deep pipelining, not to enable time domain multiplexing, is actually probably the better way to use that idea. Um, any thoughts on throughput per watt? Okay, so throughput per unit of silicon is, is important. Nowadays, throughput per watt is probably at least as important, probably more important. How, what do you think this DPJ is going to do for, for power efficiency? Is it going to be good or going to be bad? So we're getting close to the end of the course. So if you've been waiting, you know, you just jump in there. Yes, no, right? Uh, okay, somebody's saying DPJ uses more power. Michael K says worse, bad, toggles fast. Yeah, okay. So bunch of answers saying it's going to have high dynamic power. This is toggling fast. It's not going to be good. And yeah, the, the DPGA, they, they didn't publish any data on it, uh, but it's almost certainly worse. They have um, an FPGA's configuration memory doesn't change. You program the FPGA when you power it up. Maybe you program it once in a while if you're using partial reconfiguration, but that's so infrequent that it's especially still not toggling. A DPGA, uh, if we go back to this, so we can go back all the way here, um, this is really fast. This con context ID is changing at 1.6 gigahertz, and that is changing which one of these uh, values is selected, and therefore what value makes it is copied onto the select inputs of these uh, MUX. Um, 
So that's a very high toggling signal that actually is driving a reasonable amount of capacitance. So that, that's pretty bad. Um, the other thing that's gonna happen, which is more subtle, is what happens to the activity of the other signals? You know, what's going, in, what's going through this routing box and what's coming out of this LUT? It's not clear what happens to them, um, but the fact that one physical LUT is behaving as different functions, um, you know, multiple times in a user clock cycle is also probably going to increase the activity of the physical signals coming out of that LUT. Because most designs, uh, the activity of their signals is less than 50% um, because, you know, control logic and so on. The next state of a register is usually, for most logic, is actually somewhat correlated with its previous state. So most registers don't toggle every cycle. Uh, and so that's why if you look at the power estimation tools from Intel or, or Altera, they'll usually use, they don't give them any information, they'll usually use a default toggle rate of 12.5%, which is less than the 50% you get if you just said there's no correlation between one clock cycle and the ne next for any register, they all just toggle randomly. Um, now that one LUT is actually behaving as different functions throughout a clock cycle, they're probably going to get higher uh, activity rates on the outputs of those physical LUTs as well, because they're going to break some of that correlation. So I think it's probably quite bad for power. Uh, and Edmund says the, yeah, Edmund says the power will be bad uh, for, um, for dynamic power, but they claim static power is more important. Static power is important, but yeah, this is basically a false claim in my opinion. This, the static power is important, but basically FPGA architects will increase threshold voltages, sometimes do clever things, because uh, there are, we didn't have time to get to them, but there are a bunch of clever techniques people have used for power optimization at FPGAs too, to control static power. And typically they get it down to about 30% or less of the total power, um, and that's good enough, okay? And they'll, they'll sacrifice some speed to do that. So static power is, you know, is not dominant unless the FPGA architect kind of doesn't do a good job. If uh, he or she does a good job, then it's brought down to about usually 25 to 30%. It's usually not brought down much below that because it starts costing too much performance. Uh, but at 25 to 30%, it's like, well, it's mostly static, dynamic power. Static power is acceptable. We're done. Um, so the fact that these DPGAs look quite bad for dynamic power. I don't think they're going to be able to make it up on static power. Um, so I think that's another technological challenge they have. Uh, talking to, I mean, I know one of the senior engineers from, from Tabula. Uh, so they, they actually built a lot of very impressive technology. They raised $200 million in venture capital. They ultimately ran out of money. Um, a bunch of their engineers were actually hired by Altera. So that may have you know, contributed to the Stratex 10 uh, registered routing. Uh, it's kind of interesting in terms of a business study as well of things to think about that you might not occur to you when you're starting a business. So he, he told me how challenging it was to go into big companies and try to sell them you know, this new, quite different device. So you go to, say, Cisco and try to uh, convince them you should try this device. It could be more efficient for you know, this router you're work high-end router you're working on. Uh, and Cisco would listen to them, but basically what they wanted to say is, sure, port one of our existing Intel or, or sorry, uh, Xilinx or Altera designs to your, to your chip. Uh, and that's not just the Verilog, that's all the IP cores that uh, came with you know, either Xilinx or, or Altera's CAD tools. So they had to develop um, essentially compatible IP cores for all the key IP cores that Xilinx and uh, Altera had because you know, your early customers just aren't going to do a redesign. So he said the specification of a design that they would have to try to compete on wasn't just Verilog, it would also be the IP cores from Xilinx. Uh, so as a startup, that's a, a hugely expensive thing to do. They knew they had to build the chip, they knew they had to build the CAD system, they didn't expect they had, and they didn't have to build some IP, they didn't expect they'd have to build an IP catalog that effectively was compatible uh, with their competitors in order to get people interested. Um, so something to consider to start a business. How, how much money do you need to build the full product? And they basically couldn't raise that amount of money. Uh, let's see, were the compilation times really high? Uh, 
I'm not sure actually. So their, their CAD tools were also never as mature as uh, Xilinx or Alteras because it's one of the advantages you have when you're the incumbent. Uh, I hadn't heard that the, that I don't think their CAD tool runtimes were excessively high. I think they were pretty clever about uh, uh, mapping to the 3D. Um, but I don't really have any hard data on it. Uh, I don't think their CAD tool compile times were as good as Xilinx or Altera, but part of that can be just lack of time to tune it. Uh, let's see, you think the one time a DPJ would win this VF sequential task, data dependencies. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, if you have, if you have a lot of sequential logic, then it, it, it's a better fit. If it's too sequential, then it starts being a good fit to a processor. So you probably have to target more than that. Something that a DPGA would be quite good at is probably logic emulation for an ASIC. Okay, so you're really trying to build an ASIC. You want to, it's common practice to take a high-end ASIC and actually emulate it on FPGAs first. Generally, the ASIC is so big, it won't fit on any FPGA. Uh, so they have to split it across multiple chips, which is a pain because they don't have enough IOs. So they run into all sorts of partitioning problems. A DPGA would be quite good at that because they will have uh, more logic between registers because it's really targeting an ASIC, which isn't generally as aggressively pipelined, and they care a lot about capacity. Right? They're trying to fit it on the fewest number of chips. So it's probably a very good fit to that as well. The thing is that market's probably not big enough because uh, um, most FPGAs are not sold for ASIC prototyping or you're only going to buy a few chips. They're sold for end systems. Uh, let's see. For the throughput for power, if we consider the same application, it takes less time to finish in a DPGA. Uh, let's see, you got five times the toggle rate, but 0.2x user clock cycle. Yeah, I don't think your assumption is correct. Um, usually, the way they would they would phrase it is the user clock cycle is what the um, what the end user was trying to achieve because they do have physical IOs and so on. Like at a certain point, they really are talking to the outside world at say 200 megahertz. And, but they don't care internally what you do as long as your IOs work at 200 megahertz and you produce a, a data value every whatever one over 200 megahertz is. Um, so they would time to make multiplex the internals, which means that they could use a smaller chip. Uh, does that make sense? So if they could use a smaller chip that like they use fewer physical lets, then they may save silicon area or equivalently, they might be able to fit a bigger version of your design and get more parallelism. Uh, could you put more different applications of different virtual layers like time sharing and CPU? And yeah, you could do that. So I don't know if, I would guess tabulous hardware could do that, although I'm not sure they didn't emphasize it. The Trimbrigger paper that I um, you know, kind of referenced for one figure did talk about that as well. That if you build this hardware, you can use it in this time to be multiplexed fashion, but you could also use it to just very rapidly swap between different applications. Uh, if you could figure out how that's useful. You know, there's nothing that basically the change, since you're just broadcasting a pointer of what, what configuration are you using, to change that from I'm going to change every single microcycle to just I'm going to change when I feel like it is almost no change to the hardware. Um, so it could do that. It, it's unclear if there's a good use for that though or not. So um, yeah, so maybe that's useful in the cloud. Uh, I'm not sure. So. Okay, so good questions. And this also is, uh, as I said, for remote, remote uh, teaching, it's great to know people are out there. <laughs> so, uh, so we've got one minute left. I got one more topic. Uh, because we'll be over time, feel free to drop off whenever you like, and it's recorded, so you can always come back and watch later if you like to. So the last thing I was gonna talk about is basically uh, two things, configuration cells. Uh, well, I guess it's configuration cells and robustness. So you have to worry about configuration cells getting upset. And you'll see that in some FPGA applications is important. And it kind of leads into, um, into a few different technologies. One of the ways you can deal with that is not use SRAM. This is also a very brief overview of non-SRAM FPGAs. Um, okay, so SRAM FPGAs are dominant. Uh, and so uh, why do you think that is? You can type in if you have any ideas, why do SRAM FPGAs, what's good about them? And is there anything bad about them? So I'll give you a minute to just type that in. I could do another breakout room, but I think it's just more over time, so I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. 
So Gail, I see your question, but I think I'll just take that one after the class is over. I can try drawing that out. So anybody think of any positive in SRAM F2J? Uh, okay, so good, cheaper in terms of logic gates, bad, not radiation immune. So yeah, so bad, definitely one of the things we're gonna talk about is that you can actually upset these cells with radiation. Um, and yeah, a key thing is it uses the same technology as other logic. So um, they do take significant area. So that's a downside. Yes, these are all really good answers. Uh, okay, so the number one reason is that because they're standard CMOS, you can use the latest process. So that's the really big advantage. Um, I mean, there are other ones you can reprogram them infinitely. So you can, I didn't write that down, but basically you can use the same chip and program it many times. Um, negatives, fairly large area. Usually it's about 25% of the die size just for the configuration SRAM. Um, power, so is power an issue or not? Um, what do you think? Does anybody think that S, S, uh, SRAM configuration is bad for power, good for power, or just you don't care? This is one where it's probably any answer is correct. There's a little bit of truth to both sides of this one. Okay, so maybe, so we're gonna go with that. <laughs> so uh, it's not a huge problem. Sometimes people think it's a big problem, but because uh, because the, S, the configuration RAM doesn't switch, you've got basically no dynamic power. And because it doesn't switch, you also can make it as slow as you want, right? Usually what stops you from using really high threshold transistors is, um, is things get too slow. For the configuration cell, as long as it still works, you almost don't care about its speed because uh, you can program them in parallel um, and you don't have to have your programming be super fast. Okay. Um, you know, that said, you can't make VT so high. If you make VT infinitely high, it just doesn't work anymore. So it's not true in the latest process technologies. The configuration SRAM does consume some static power. So it's not completely negligible, but it's not the biggest problem. Uh, it's volatile. Okay, so that's a downside, but it's not a big problem. Um, they're volatile, meaning it doesn't remember its state when you turn the power off. Uh, what you do for that is most FPGAs have a flash chip on the same board as them. When you turn the board on, the FPGA automatically reads its configuration from the flash. So there's some cost for the extra flash, but it's not huge because flash is relatively cheap. There's some time before the FPGA, so maybe 100 milliseconds before the FPGA is actually read in its configuration. And during that 100 milliseconds, it's not able to do anything useful. In most systems, that's not a big problem uh, because the whole system's being powered up. It is a problem in a few systems. So in some systems, you need an FPGA to come awake right away. For example, modern boards have, circuit boards have many different power supplies on them, like lots of different voltages for lots of different chips and something needs to sequence that. And often it's a small FPGA. That small FPGA that is actually gonna sequence the power supply, the power up of the board has to wake up really fast. So it either has to be a non-volatile FPGA or what it, what it is for a lot of FPGAs nowadays is a conventional SRAM FPGA with an embedded flash, okay? So you can also do that. And that is that can be a, an SRAM FPGA. This is, uh, for example, Altera's uh, Max 2 series and Max 10 series do this. They're small FPGAs, OK? Um, one of their markets is wake up and control the power up of the whole circuit board. They do that by having embedded flash and a really wide bus. So they have like a 4,000 bit bus to very rapidly copy the configuration data from the flash into the SRAM FPGA when it wakes up. Um, so it behaves like an instant on FPGA, even though it uses SRAM as its configuration. For bigger FPGAs like Versol and Stratix 10, that's not their target market. They don't worry about it. They use an external flash because it's cheaper. Okay, soft errors. That's the main thing I wanna talk about. Um, so yeah, software errors you know, basically are, are non-permanent errors. So usually caused by radiation. That's the main source of soft errors in uh, FPGAs. So your, your truth table of your lookup table is supposed to have a certain value, right? It's supposed to be, uh, I don't know, an AND gate. So it's supposed to be one and a bunch of zeros. And a radiation event happens. 
and it basically changes to all zeros. So no longer an AND gate, it's just a zero gate. So that's a problem. And until you do something uh, like power cycle your system and reconfigure the FPGA, uh, your FPGA is doing the wrong thing, right? It's no longer doing the logic function you wanted. So that can be a big problem in some applications. And this is a problem that's getting worse with scaling, okay? Um, the reason it's getting worse with scaling is radiation induced uh, let's see if I have this on the next, uh, let's see, yeah. Radiation-induced errors are basically what happens is I've got a transistor, okay? So this is N plus, N plus, this is P minus, and here's my gate. Uh, and I've got, uh, let's see, this is an N loss, so this is connected to ground, and maybe this part is this node is connected as part of an SRAM. And there's a depletion region around this, okay? So a radiation event happens. What happens is some particle, uh, say a neutron, hits your crystal lattice. So it hits an atom and, and it basically uh, creates a whole bunch of electron hole pairs. So, uh, so it creates electrons and creates uh, and holes and basically those charge carriers will be collected by this depletion region. And if enough of them are collected, it will lower the voltage on this node by enough to, uh, to flip the SRM cell, okay? Um, that problem's getting worse with scaling because what resists this, this uh, node uh, flipping is basically the amount of charge that's already on it. And as they get smaller, there's less charge on them. So it's easier and easier for a radiation event to produce enough electron hole pairs uh, to flip an SRAM cell. I don't think I have a really good picture of this. Hopefully I have some picture later. Uh, okay, so how big a deal is this? So if you wanna find out information on soft errors in SRAM based FPGAs. So it's a bigger deal for FPGAs than it is for most chips because in an FPGA, this SRAM is actually controlling what the chip does. So you're not just upsetting some register you're actually upsetting like a logic gate. The logic gate is suddenly changing its function. So that's a bigger problem. Also registers tend to be relative, they're larger. Um, registers are usually larger than SRAM cells. So they're not as uh, easy to upset. So this is a bigger deal for FPGAs than it is for ASICs. If you wanna get data on how big a deal, it's actually best to go to a company that makes uh, non-volatile FPGAs. So MicroSemi, um, makes flash-based FPGAs. And that's uh, the paper that is optional for next week is on one of their flash-based FPGAs. So you wanna get data on how big a deal are soft errors. You don't go to one of the, uh, you don't go to Intel or Zonix, you go to MicroSemi, because MicroSemi is very happy to tell you the data. So they took a 65 nanometer SRAM FPGA. So not theirs, one of their competitors. Uh, and this actually will be a cycling device. Um, so is 120,000 logic elements. Uh, and they found that at sea level, the average time before they get what's called a single event upset, which means a radiation induced soft error, they flipped an SRAM cell, is 39 years. Um, the Earth's atmosphere is our friend, okay? So if we didn't have the atmosphere and, uh, and the Earth's magnetic field screening out radiation, we would all be dead fairly soon. Um, so as you move up through the atmosphere, so at 5,000 feet, which is Denver, Okay, so that's actually still not that high. Uh, this actually drops from 39 years to 12 years. If you go into a, an airplane, uh, it drops a lot more. And by the time you're in a satellite, it's an hour. Okay, and the difference is you're getting less and less shielding. There's less atmosphere protecting you. Uh, it means the long, wrong logic function until you reset. So again, it's worse than, than a soft error in a microprocessor or something where you might just corrupt the data register. Uh, and this number already worries like high reliability customers. So uh, when I was at Altera, one of the customers I would visit was Cisco. And Cisco, the Cisco division I was visiting this one time was a high reliability part of Cisco. They're building core routers that go into, um, you know, like Bell and Rogers, those kind of places. Like, uh, and those core routers have incredibly strong uptime guarantees. Uh, like they can only go down for a few seconds a year because it's... Uh, um, it's very disruptive, right? Like that's like phone calls getting dropped or internet connections for entire businesses getting dropped. 
So numbers like this, that a single not that big FPGA could have a single event upset every 39 years actually worried them already because it means that a big FPGA might have an event every five years. And if they put uh, 10 of these FPGAs in a core router, then they may be getting an event every six months and that's way more than they can tolerate for their uptime. Um, so there are, I mean, there are other people who don't care, right? But, uh, but for these higher liability customers, it's already a problem. Uh, yeah, Michael, you're asking about radiation shielding and magnetic shielding. So yeah, in space, you can put shielding on this uh, and they do put some shielding in to protect the chips, uh, but you can't put shielding that's anything close to what our atmosphere is. So you need your chips to be much more tolerant of radiation. Um, yeah, because even with a certain amount of shielding, it, basically it's density. Like the way the atmosphere protects us is that the, you know, the uh, you know, the protons, the neutrons that are being shed by the sun, the cosmic uh, radiation, cosmic rays, basically have a low probability of making it through the atmosphere. And it's just because there's so many uh, atoms and molecules between us and space. And you cannot duplicate that on a spaceship, right? Like you, if you, if you put a certain number of feet of lead shielding, then you would, but now you need, you need a, beyond a rocket to get it into, into orbit. So they have to make uh, trade-offs. Um, and redundancy is an option though. So that's a good question. Okay, so what can we do? Um, and yeah, for really high reliability customers, one of the things they do is redundancy. So they have to make it that they don't, a single chip failure won't kill their system. Okay, so what can you do in an FPGA though to have better soft error performance? So the first thing you can do is try to add capacitance to the storage nodes. So this is an SRAM cell and the, in an SRAM cell that is for, normally for an SRAM cell, you don't actually want um, very much capacitance in the cell because it slows it down and it makes it take more power when you read or write it. But for these configuration SRAM cells, we don't write them very often and we don't care how fast they are. So you actually try to get as much capacitance as you can on the storage node. Um, so yeah, they'll try to add as much metal capacitance as possible uh, to, uh, to these A and B parts, uh, and try basically making the cell harder to offset. Uh, and sometimes FPJ vendors will actually make the SRAM cell bigger than they have to, even though that's uh, painful in order to get more capacitance on these nodes and kind of meet what they see as a, a, a minimum acceptable specification. Uh, and there are, there have been some papers published, uh, about using, um, technology that was originally created for DRAM like building special capacitors in the metal stack uh, as a way to get more capacitance on these nodes without taking much more area. So, um, but that's a relatively low impact way to do this. When you lay out your SRAM cell, you're doing the opposite of what you usually do in logic. You're trying to get as much capacitance as possible on these storage nodes. Okay, uh, one step beyond that is you can use redundant storage nodes. Uh, so, Normally, this is maybe a little hard to see, but normally an SRAM cell is basically cross-coupled inverters. Uh, and, and then you have access transistors, right? So these are access transistors down here to write the cell. And we don't quite have cross-coupled inverters. Usually we have two inverters and they're just kind of crossed over. Um, what we have here are actually four inverters, okay? Well, they're not quite inverters, but they're almost, uh, they're inverter-like, okay? So this is a more complicated SRAM cell. It has more transistors. It has 12 transistors instead of the six you would usually have. Uh, it's given a, a name. It's called the dual interlocked or dice cell. And basically, you don't have to go through all the details of how it works, but it actually, instead of the two storage nodes in a usual SRAM cell, actually has four. Okay, so a normal SRAM cell basically has two storage nodes that are storing its state. Right, so this would be like the positive state, and this would be the negative of that state. Um, and a soft error occurs when one of these storage nodes basically collects so many charge carriers that it flips from you know from zero to one, for example, and and it does that for long enough that it that the circuitry manages to flip the other side of the cell as well. Okay, so that that's what happens in a normal SRAM cell. In this one, it actually has four storage nodes, so it has essentially two of the positive nodes and two of the negative nodes. So it's got duplicate storage nodes. Um, 
And the structure is such that flipping any one of these uh, storage nodes, so maybe this storage node is currently supposed to have a zero because that's what you're storing. And you collect a, collect a bunch of charge carriers because of a radiation event and it flips to one. The other three uh, will not be affected. Uh, the structure of how they feed each other guarantees that this will then go back, eventually go back to zero because it can't flip the other ones. Okay, so it's a more complicated feedback structure and it guarantees that if any one of these four storage nodes gets the wrong value, the other three will correct it. Um, whereas in a conventional SRAM cell, you only have two storage nodes. So if one of them is wrong, it's kind of anybody's guess of what happens, right? They, uh, whether that wrong one corrupts the correct one or whether the correct one manages to fix the wrong one. Um, okay, so it increases the area of your configuration RAM by about twice. Uh, and since configuration RAM is 25% of your area in an FPGA, this does have a significant cost. But it, it does mean that you're much more resistant to hard it, to radiation induced errors. Um, and Xilinx actually has some special chips that do this. It's not in their mainstream FPGAs, um, but they have uh, some, some that are called, I think they're called Q-Pro, uh, and they have a Vertex 5 uh, Q-Pro device. Um, where they actually changed all of the configuration cells to this more complicated and more expensive structure and it's intended for space applications. So, and it's very expensive, okay? So that is not a state-of-the-art chip because it's several generations behind. And uh, I visited a satellite manufacturer again when I was at Altera um, and, and they were saying that they were paying $50,000 a chip for this uh, device. So it, uh, but they needed it, right? So uh, they will pay it when they have to. Okay, so another thing you can do is just get rid of the SRAM entirely. So you can use a flash cell. This is the optional paper for this week. So if you wanna know more about this, you can go read that paper. Um, what a flash cell does, okay, so flash transistors are basically, um, they have an extra gate, okay? So we have the regular gate here, and then we have a floating gate. And let me just highlight that. So this is the floating gate. Uh, let's, let's actually just do this part. Okay, so this is a flash transistor, right? I've got a regular gate and I've got a floating gate. Uh, and by applying sufficiently large voltages to the regular gate and the source and the drain, you can actually get charge carriers uh, to be injected onto the floating gate. Okay, so you need high voltages typically to program a flash cell. But once you program it, then at the normal operating uh, voltages of, of this other gate, you won't change the floating gate at all. Okay, so you basically, the, you inject charge carriers onto the floating gate during programming, they stay there, and they change the threshold voltage of, the, um, of this transistor, basically, um, to turn it permanently on, permanently off. Because that's how flash works in general. What microsemi does is they take this floating gate and they extend it. So they have one transistor here, which is they call the sense device. That's the one they're going to program. Okay, so they're going to use that device to inject when they're programming charge carriers onto the floating gate. And then the floating gate actually extends out to another transistor. And this transistor is actually the routing switch. So depending on what charge they put on the floating gate, they can permanently turn this, well, for the duration of the operation of the FPGA, they can turn this uh, switch device on. Um, so they wind up with a pass transistor that doesn't need an SRAM cell to control. Uh, and it still can be reprogrammed many times, right? This is a non-destructive process to inject charge carriers onto this floating gate. Um, so what they wind up with is they get a smaller, they, they have a very small configuration cell. They only need to basically have a, instead of an SRAM cell controlling this uh, pass gate basically, they just have one flash transistor controlling it. Uh, so it's an area reduction. Um, and it's also non-volatile and it's also radiation immune. Like if radiation hits the, silicon lattice, it, it doesn't hit this floating gate. This floating gate is 
is essentially so small that the uh, uh, and and it's also not connected to anything that it doesn't collect charge carriers. Um, so you can't upset this cell with a radiation event. So it's naturally immune to radiation events and soft errors, uh, and it also is quite small. So there's a couple, and it's also non-volatile. So there are a bunch of advantages to this. There is, there also are a couple of disadvantages. Otherwise, everybody would use flash cells. Um, so we already talked about one of them, which is like not on the latest process. So in order to use a cell like this, I need to have um, these flash transistors, these floating gate transistors, and I also have to have lots of regular transistors, regular logic transistors. That means I now need a custom process. That custom process is not available or won't be available at the same time um, as a regular process. So at the same time that the 65 nanometer flash um, was coming out, you know, Intel and Xilinx were approximately two to three process generations ahead of that, uh, probably about two. Okay, so being behind by a couple of process generations is, is a fairly big deal. Um, so there is a significant cost to this. Uh, let's see, see, Tony has a question about uh, fused FPGAs. And yes, um, okay, so actually this is what I was just talking about. I should have gone on to my very next one. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of process nodes behind and being a couple of process nodes behind uh, cost you a lot of capacity. Um, they also need high programming voltages. Uh, this is basically showing how you program this floating gates. You, for example, put negative 18 volts on the word line that you can control, positive one volt on the uh, drain, so the transistor. Uh, so you need high voltages. And one of the problems with those high voltages is you need to make sure that this negative 18 volt does not connect to any regular logic transistors because your regular logic transistors are built to operate at maybe one volt. 18 volts will destroy them. Um, so that costs you some area in your programming circuitry. You have to be able to handle these big voltages. And you have to be quite careful that they can never, even for you know short periods of time during programming, connect to your regular logic transistors through any path, because if they can, they're going to destroy them. Um, so you have to add some isolation of these programming voltages from your normal transistors, and that costs you some of your area gain. And then you lose, as I said, a lot by being behind on uh, process technology. Um, where microsemi has carved out a successful niche, though, is you know high reliability applications like planes, space, uh, where you can't tolerate soft errors. So this is a big advantage for them. Because this device is non-volatile, um, they can also uh, cut the power to it for devices that um, are going to be off most of the time. So maybe it's a battery powered device and it's usually off. They can cut the power to a device like this and it can wake up right away. So it gives them some interesting, like when they bring the power back, it immediately wakes up. So it gives them some interesting options uh, to make low power FPGAs as well. And that's kind of where their, their niche is. Uh, extremely low static power, instant on, uh, not, su not subject to uh, soft error FPGAs. Okay, I'm going to talk about this. Basically, they, they have to keep, because they're using custom technology, um, they have to, moving to the next process generation for them is often a bit tricky. So the structure I just showed you with the floating gate they had to adjust that some when they went to 28 nanometers. So they still use floating gates, but it's not quite as elegant, not quite the same structure they had at 65. And that's that's kind of one of the challenges you have with using custom processes. Okay, um, let's see. So Tony was asking, does anybody use fuses? And yes, so uh, Actel, which is the company that became Microsemi, uh, also uh, made and continues to make antifuse based FPGAs. Okay, so what's an antifuse based? An antifuse is just the opposite of a fuse. Okay, a fuse is basically uh, initially connected, and if you blow it or program it, it becomes disconnected. An antifuse is initially not connected, and if you blow it or program it, it becomes connected. Um, so this is an antifuse used in an FPGA. Um, so we've got metal here, we've got metal here. Uh, in between them, we've got a VS, so it's another conductor. Uh, and what we have is this special thing 
This is a metal to metal antifuse. So this is a dielectric, something that is an insulator, but it's intended to be uh, an insulator that if you put enough voltage, say positive voltage here and negative voltage here, if you put enough voltage across these pieces of metal, the metal will actually uh, migrate through the dielectric and will actually extend um, you know, kind of dendrites of metal and it'll eventually short it out, okay? So it'll connect across this antifuse. Um, but you need relatively big voltages to make that happen. So the advantages of this is it's really small, okay? So instead of having, you consider this to, you know, a pass transistor controlled by an SRAM cell, it's kind of the fundamental switch for building SRAM FPGAs out of, this is way smaller, right? This is seven transistors. This is actually in a via. So this is just where two metal wires cross. It's smaller than even a single transistor. So it's really small. Its resistance is fairly low, okay? Um, its resistance is better than a pass transistor, for example. Uh, so that's all good. But we need these pretty big programming voltages. Because, um, and, and that's a problem because again, if we, have, if we have some transistors, so maybe this is connected to the gate of a transistor, then putting a sufficiently positive voltage on this is gonna blow up this transistor. So we gotta make sure that our programming is isolated from our transistors. Um, so that's gonna cost us some complexity in area. And the most fundamental thing is that it's, it's a custom process, so it's not scaling very well. So at least the last time I checked, the, the latest commercial FPGA that used these antifuses was 0.15 micron. And that's uh, like 100 times less density than 14 nanometers, which outweighs the fact that they get a really small switch. So using custom processes is tough. Okay, there, there are a bunch of papers they'll find as well on alternative configuration memory elements. So there's magnetoresistive RAM, there's ferroelectric RAM, there's ovonic, which means phase change RAM. Phase change RAM is a bit like the antifuse I just showed you. So the idea of each of these is could we make a smaller, uh, smaller uh, configuration element to be non-volatile, it wouldn't have SEU. Um, so it's been an active area of research and still is an active area of research. When you read a paper on these, you want to you want to always check a couple things. Um, FPGA configuration is used in a different way than normal RAM because you're always reading it out. So in a normal RAM, you've got a whole lot of bits in a 2D array and you read out one word. Okay, so you read out that word, it comes out to whatever the read circuitry is. So the read circuitry cost is essentially amortized over many data words in a potentially big RAM. And the read circuitry is generally a lot more complicated for these you know, customized RAMs uh, or customized memory technologies. In an FPGA, your, your RAM is quite, your configuration for RAM is quite different. You essentially have one incredibly wide RAM where you're reading the whole thing all the time because this is connected to this lot, this is connected to another lot, and so on. Um, that means that you need read circuitry for the whole thing, or else you have to copy the whole thing into SRAM, which would sort of defeat the purpose anyway. Um, and that's something a lot of these papers neglect. They, they, they talk about how dense the memory array is, but they don't talk about how you read it out. And how you read it out is quite different for an FPGA. The other thing I've already talk, touched on a couple of times, can you program it with standard voltages? If you need high voltages, uh, then you're gonna have to isolate, during programming, you have to isolate all your regular transistors from those programming voltages. That usually means you have to put some special transistors in that can, can kind of act as a voltage break and that costs you complexity in area. Um, otherwise, even though you didn't really wanna be doing anything with those transistors to blow them up. Okay, and then the last technique is one that can be used with any FPGA and is used with SRAM FPGAs when you need high reliability. Uh, and this is uh, essentially uh, one of the comments from before, like Michael, um, on redundancy. So you can use something called triple modular redundancy. Um, so let's say I need high reliability and, uh, and maybe I'm even gonna put it in space where it's gonna be subject to a lot of radiation and I only have an SRAM FPGA. Like I need a big FPGA so I can't use one of those flash-based ones. What you can do is you can make three copies of all your logic. So what I really want to do is I just want an FPGA that does F1. That's my function, okay? So it's got some inputs, it's got some outputs. Um, but I can't trust that, it's, that my FPGA is properly uh, computing F1. So what I do is I make three copies of F1 
Okay. Uh, and then I also make voting circuitry. Okay, so I'd make three copies of majority voting circuits. And what that gives me is now an error in any one of these copies cannot produce uh, an invalid output. Um, I get three sets of outputs, they're all the same, but basically an error in any one of these will actually not cause an error in my outputs because the majority voters will overwhelm it. And because I got three sets of outputs, an error in my, one of my majority voters will actually only affect one of my outputs. The other two are still correct, okay? I take these outputs, I feed them to my next stage of logic or to my outputs of my whole chip. Um, and basically the fact that there are three of them means I can triplicate the next stage. So I do this for the whole design. Uh, I also make sure that I do this majority voting on any feedback paths. So basically, if there's an error, I, uh, I vote on what is the correct thing. And that's what goes back into feedback paths to make sure I don't corrupt the state of, uh, of any of these uh, three copies. Okay, so the basic idea, triplicate everything, make voters, don't rely on one voter, make three voters. And now one error can never cause a mistake because it, two out of three will still say, agree on the correct answer. Um, so it's, it's expensive though. So this means you're gonna have more than three times the area cost because you first made three copies of your function and then you made three of these uh, majority voting circuits. Uh, but one soft error will never cause a failure now. Um, if you had multiple soft errors over time, so maybe I get a soft error there and then you know sometime later, maybe three hours later, I'm in space, I get a soft error there. Okay, now I get a problem, right? Because two out of three won't agree. So all modern FPGAs, SRAM FPGAs, have something called uh, CRC or scrubbing circuitry, cyclic redundancy check circuitry. So what they do is they basically read out, you can, you can set a flag in your bit stream so that the FPGA will constantly read back its own configuration one row at a time. Okay, so it'll read out a row of its configuration. There are some extra redundant bits here. They're basically parity bits. It will use them to check for some circuitry down here that's doing the reading. It's all still in the FPGA. And that circuitry is going to check the parity bits. Uh, and the, they're not just parity bits with basically enough parity bits. You can not just detect errors. You can also correct them. It'll correct uh, any soft errors that are in here and then write back the new data. Okay. And it does that constantly when you turn this on. So it'll read one word, then, you know, uh, 100 microseconds later, it'll read the next word and so on. Um, so it can go through the whole configuration memory about once every 100 milliseconds. And that means that while you can have a soft error, that soft error is going to get corrected within about 100 milliseconds. The probability of having, if you've, if you've triplicated your logic like this, now the only way it can fail is if I get two soft errors. And those two soft errors have to occur within 100 milliseconds of each other because this first soft error is going to get corrected after 100 milliseconds. And the probability of that happen becomes very small. So this actually is, this is safe even, uh, even for space, okay? And FPGAs are used quite a lot in space. They're actually also used quite a bit in avionics. In avionics and space, you really want to use techniques like this or use a flash-based FPGA. Don't use a uh, SRAM-based one. Um, and yeah, so Rakshith, you're exactly right. You do frequent scrubbing to get rid of the multiple error case. Um, but because 100 milliseconds is still an awful lot of clock cycles, you in general can't tolerate that your design does something wrong for 100 milliseconds. So if you really care about reliability, you also put in uh, this triplicated logic and voting circuitry. Um, Xilinx can actually do this automatically for you. So in Xilinx, you can actually take a design module. So some part of your design hierarchy, could be your whole design, could be a piece. And you can actually uh, set a property saying, I want triple modular redundancy. And it'll actually automatically make all three copies of this and the majority votes for you. Um, it's kind of a clever feature. So their CAD tools make this easier uh, because they want to have avionics and uh, space customers. Uh, any questions on any of that? I think that was actually my last slide. 
uh, one, one funny conversation I had, again, when I was at Altera, I was talking to uh, a customer. Uh, the sales force had put me in contact with a customer who basically had questions about basically how common were our soft errors and, and, uh, and also they wanted to know how much timing margin there was in our, to uh, how much margin there was in our timing models. Um, and uh, so I was answering their questions, except I told them you should just close timing. I'm not going to tell you how much margin we have. And at some point I asked, when they were asking all these questions about soft error rates, and I couldn't really answer most of them because even inside the company that was kept pretty secret. Uh, I asked like, what is this going into? And they said, it's going into a, a certain plane. And I said, we, you can't put this in a plane. <laughs> You're going to have radiation errors. Uh, like, I don't know the exact number, but this is going to be unsafe. You can't do that. And they said, oh, don't worry. It's the entertainment system. Uh, and I said, oh, okay, it's the entertainment system, then, then who cares about soft errors? And they said, oh, no, 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 we care because if the entertainment system goes down, people are not going to fly the plane again. It's super important that the very entertainment system be robust. So uh, anyway, so I still remember that. I was happy it was not the, uh, some kind of critical safety system, uh, but I underestimated how important uh, a robust entertainment system was. So any questions on anything we've talked about? Okay, uh, if, if so, that, that's the end of the course. Uh, enjoy the final assignments, enjoy your holidays. Uh, if there's interest, I'm happy to have like another uh, Zoom coffee hour on Friday. If you're interested in that, you can just type it in the chat now or post on Piazza. And uh, if there are, I'll hang around to see if there are any questions. If there are no questions, then, uh, well, thanks for being part of this highly unusual uh, uh, delivery method of this course, uh, and uh, hopefully I will see many of you in person around U of T in the next year or two.